your hands together and give a warm and wonderful Conscious Life Expo welcome to David Wilcock and Corey Good. All right, how's everybody feeling out there? Awesome. <clears throat> I, okay, the clothes, I get it, all right? Cuban, tuxedo. But there's a method to this, okay? The thing is, the tuxedo comes off when it gets so hot in here from the body heat that we, as your entertainers and informers, are sweating. And in other years when I do this expo, you notice I'm always touching my nose and people are accusing me of doing cocaine. <laughs> what I'm trying to tell you is that you think it's hot down there. I got six feet more of heat that goes to rise, right? And within 20 minutes, my nose is just going to be dumping off sweat. So I will try to remember not to touch my nose. But I don't expect that will work. <laughs> so how the heck did I end up after being online for 20 years doing all this stuff, how did I end up crossing paths with somebody like Corey Good? Because it's almost like a foreign language. One of the problems that we have is, is people who have not really been educated about the big picture of UFOs, they watch something like Cosmic Disclosure, they're like, who the heck is this dude? <laughs> because you notice when Corey's talking, he's like totally deadpan. Right? He's not in it to, to, he's not like mugging for the camera. He's not wanting to look good. <laughs> he's out there, and we have both been through incredible hardships to do what we're doing. And we are not giving up. Not even after we did our last taping, and Corey ends up in the frickin' emergency room. I don't know if you heard about this. But I put the whole thing out on my Facebook page, and you guys prayed for him, and that's probably why he's alive right now. Thank you. I'm really not kidding. It's a whole other talk I don't have time to go into today, but suffice it to say, there's a guy named Dr. Daniel Benor, and he analyzed hundreds and hundreds of different studies of healing done scientifically in laboratory conditions. 64% of the healing studies of psychic healing showed a profound effect. So what the lame stream is going to do is they're going to show you one of the 36% that didn't work, and they say, oh, see, healing has been scientifically disproven. But we know that it works, and I don't use that power very often, but in a case like that, I absolutely said this is it. If there was ever a time to marshal the crowdfunding of healing, <laughs> okay? We did it, and he's still with us. Thank God. I got broken into a very strange new reality in 1993 when a good friend of mine in college comes in all white-faced and says, dude, aliens are real. And I'm like laughing. And he wanted me to sit down, and, but I could tell pretty quickly he's very serious. Turns out he had a two-hour private briefing with his college physics professor who had worked for NASA throughout the 1970s. And in the higher echelons of NASA, it was considered common knowledge that extraterrestrials had visited Earth, that they had landed here, that they had crashed their ships, and the ships had been back-engineered into useful technology. And he said, and this was in 1993, within 20 years, the technology that you are going to see will blow your mind, and it will come out in the open. And now we take for granted that we got these little buddies here, okay, in which this is like the whole freaking desktop tower computer in one little thing. We kind of have taken this for granted. Well, that's about the 20-year 20, 20 time frame is 2013. Sure enough, all this technology that nobody had anticipated ends up emerging. And that was pretty fantastic in and of itself, a, a fulfilled prophecy. After he told me this data, which included a lot of specifics, you've probably all heard it before, about how there were three types, all, all this NASA guy knew was there were three types of beings, some of which look like greys, some of which look just like humans, but they're definitely not born on Earth. And they might have little differences, like their irises are purple, and they have like a diamond shape instead of a round iris, or f subtle little things like ridges on the roof of their mouth instead of a flat palate like we have. You get enough specifics like that, including propulsion systems and all this weird stuff, and you say, you know what, this guy is telling the truth. Then a few years later, 
Out comes Colonel Philip Corso, who literally said exactly the same thing that I was told in the book the day after Roswell about parts that had been taken out of UFOs and back-engineered into, and I will list some for you, computer chips, fiber optic cables, light-emitting diodes, LED lights. We didn't have that before. Kevlar, like for the bulletproof vest. Velcro, believe it or not. Infrared night vision. And then there's other technologies that we don't get to hear about, like anti-gravity. So even back in 1993, I'm thinking, well, wait a minute. If our government, if you want to call it that, got these things and used them and could back-engineer them, then why wouldn't they have taken off outside of Earth's atmosphere? Why wouldn't they have gone around our solar system? And then why wouldn't they want to land on some of these other places and figure out what was there? So very early along in my work, I was lucky enough to find the work of Richard C. Hoagland, who got into Mars. And it, this was the way the book looked when I first got it, back in, again, 1993. And it freaking blew me away, because I had heard from my buddy that he had done a presentation at the United Nations talking about the space on Mars that he's pointing to right here. That this is not just some trick of light and shadow, but in fact, as you see here, you have this artificial looking face. It's clearly human-like with a headdress around it next to what very obviously looks like a city of pyramids. So you notice there's some very, very pyramid-like things here, but let's take a look at kind of a side angle now. You see the face up at the top right, the pyramids down there on the left, and look down there on the right. That one down there is a five-sided pyramid called the D&M. And this is what it looks like from overhead. Do you think that's some kind of just random crater or mountain? No, come on. And also what we see is that the, the proportions of the human, the Vitruvian man, like Leonardo da Vinci drew, you spread your arms and legs out, that's what it looks like, like it's a human being. Now this thing is estimated to be one and a half miles wide based on the size of the, nat of the Mars orbiter frames. One and a half miles wide and probably over a half a mile tall. You could fit millions of people inside this structure alone. And then the other very strange thing, if you look at it, let's see where, I can probably look at it better here. You'll notice that at the top left, there is this uh, river of what looks like, like something ran off of it. And it appears that this thing was actually blown up from the inside, and that's the melt-off of all the heated debris that was inside. There was a war. These people got wiped out. So Hoagland also was really into this stuff about alignments, and he said there was all these alignments between the objects on Mars that we found. And I got so excited about this that it began a research binge. In his book, he also describes some very strange stuff that they found on the moon, beginning with the first mission around the moon that took pictures, which was not America. It was the Russians in 1965. Now look at this stuff. This is before it all got classified. Now you're not going to see very much here, so I'm going to zoom in. What we're looking at right now is a photo of the moon. Now that, that thing on the bottom left, that circle, is not what we're looking at. That is just some instrument that got in the way of the shot. You look down at the bottom right corner of this photo. I'm going to zoom in on it a little bit now. You can't really see it, so I'm going to do it again even closer. There is a freaking glass dome down there. You see that on the bottom right? On the limb of the moon? It's a freaking dome of glass. What the heck is that thing doing down there? That's not supposed to be there. And if you look carefully, it you can actually... It used to be a dome. Well, yeah, it got, it got blown up. <laughs> no, he's right. And we're, this is all going to be part of our story. So this is a smashed up dome. And this is the physical evidence, okay? This is 1965, before the government was classifying what they saw. There it is. And it looks like a pyramid. You notice that there's two sides that slope up to the same size, and then it's got a flat top, just like the ones in Mesoamerica. Sh very shortly, just a few frames after, the moon rotates a little bit more. That one that we saw on the bottom right is now out of view, because it's now covered by more of the Earth moon's size. And then this little guy shows up in the middle on the right. Look at that. You see it over there? Let's take a closer look now. Oh my god. Now this thing is estimated to be miles tall. And you actually have the skeptics trying to say 
Oh yeah, this is just some glitch in the in the film. Two glitches in a row? One that looks like a pyramid of glass, one that looks like a tower? You're telling me that's a glitch? How could this thing be sticking miles above the surface? Now, if these were the only examples, that would be fine, but then we have this very, very strange thing Hoagland found. Frame 4822, a lot of times you ask for it, you get totally nothing, it just looks black, but then he kept asking for it and asking for it, and it turns out that one of the times that they sent in a request for it, they got this guy. It doesn't look like a whole lot, and one of the things that he pointed out here was this weird little area in which you see what appears to be a square uh, clearing right here. And you can see the sides of the square. You also see what kind of look like pyramids, like a row of pyramids here. Okay, that's all fine and good. Some people want to believe that, some people don't. But when you go over here, NASA typically crops it out right about here. But when he got the original, when whoever was supposed to hide things away in drawer 4822 forgot about not giving them the original, because they got 12 different copies of this thing. Some of it didn't have this cropped out over here, and this is what they saw on the surface of the moon. It's in the original. Lots of people have seen the original. This is not fake. Do you think that looks like a geological formation? Absolutely not. This is a base. It's very likely an active base. This was taken during the Apollo missions, so we're looking at like 1969. And it clearly looks as if you have a series of rooms that are all interconnected at right angles and a tower in the middle that sticks up a little more. And it looks like it's made out of glass-like material. There could be lots of people living in there. Then we have this very strange thing. This is an example of photos that uh, the engineer Ken Johnson was told to destroy his original copies of Apollo photographs, which he was storing. At one point, they were stored in, an, in a broken down vagrant McDonald's, believe it or not. And it was no longer being used. And so there was all these boxes of NASA images of, of the moon, and, and they told him, burn them, destroy them. And he didn't, thank God. Now, we've had Donna Teets for the Disclosure Project 2001. I was there. She, lit, she then got the name Donna Hare saying that NASA, her testimony was that NASA airbrushes real stuff out of these photographs. This is the official NASA image of this frame right here, and you notice down here where the arrow is, it's different. If you go to the Ken Johnston version over here, there's a frickin' dome on the surface of the moon, which they deleted. So please, when your friends are telling you you know, this is a live stream, so you guys can get this, and you can have this at home. You can watch it as many times as you want. You can show people the proof. Something is going on here. There's stuff on the moon that isn't supposed to be there. And then this one really blew me away. This is when Ro Richard Hoagland and I ended up co-authoring together. This is the original NASA AS-14-669301. And it doesn't look like much, although there's this little tiny fleck of blue you can't really see. But when you image enhance it, you see all this stuff that looks like glass. And then uh, another frame taken just a few steps away is uh, 669279. Look at this. Just with a little bit of Photoshop, all you got to do is use the curves filter, which is just pulls out more of what's in the image. And all of a sudden, you see glass beams on a massive scale. I mean, this thing... Whatever they posed in front of, it is freaking enormous. Okay, that is an enormous, enormous object. Here's another example where the sun was setting and light catches off of some of these glass ruins. And you see shards poking up off the surface of the moon. It's totally amazing. Now, Corey has also talked about the idea that a lot of ships were left behind on the moon's surface. And this is one that I didn't put in my book. For whatever reason, I just I can only use so many images. But this is AS15, P9625, and 9630. Now look at this. What we're seeing here is a crater that has this very strange object in it. And when we do these two images together, and then we basically sharpen it using known filters, look at what happens. It's called a composite. Oh my gosh. Now, Corey, um, 
does this look like anything that you've ever seen? Do you think this one is, is a real example? It very well could be. There are a number of crashed vessels that are on the, on the moon that were from antiquity. There was a major treaty signed, and in that treaty, they, are, they left all of the debris from the big battle that they had as a reminder or a testament for other generations so that they wouldn't uh, have such a uh, terrible war again. So to me, this is an example, and this is another one that's really, really classic. It's called the Blair Cuspids. I talk about it in the book. This is one of the only surviving images of it from Argosy Magazine by Ivan T. Sanderson. And if you can't see it very well, let's, let's do this next one. Okay, what you're seeing here is literally an object that is many stories tall, at least 13 stories tall, obelisk on the surface of the moon with others around it. And this was formally being analyzed scientifically as of about 1968, and then once again, the clamp goes down. So, Corey, do you think that they were deliberately allowing some stuff like this out in case they might disclose earlier than they ended up doing? Is that part of what was going on here? Yes, they have to seed the consciousness. That's the way their magic works. They will put out information and then redact it or ridicule it later, but the seed is planted. So, yes, it's uh, to set things up. That they have things planned out hundreds of years, and it, it's just a part of their limited disclosure. All right, the jacket is off. This is getting real, folks. <laughs> We've gone from Tux to Cuba. Okay. Now, this was a Russian depiction of a more side-angle view of what they think was down there. And sure enough, it looks like a city of obelisks. And interestingly enough, a comic book that comes out two years after this breaks into the news called UFO Flying Saucers Issue Number 2 actually did a comic treatment of this. Here's the cover of the magazine and Gold Key Comics. They're the ones that used to do the Donald Duck. My father used to take me to the newsstand every Sunday. I'd buy these Gold Key Comics all the time. Our graphic novel's going to look way better than that. <laughs> okay, fair enough. This is a historical document, though, bro. you got to appreciate that. And sure enough, what we see here is UFOs on the moon. And then, sure enough, we have this guy here, and he says, my colleagues and I believe that they may be some kind of obelisk, completely different from anything else on the moon's surface. <laughs> now, I don't know if you can see what I can see from here, but you look at this dude's eyes for a minute. That, those are the eyes of a happy man. That's all I'm going to say, folks. They are blood red. <laughs> Keeping the secret is you can just extrapolate, too much. <laughs> you can extrapolate from that what you like. He looks like he is baked as a cake. Okay, I'm going to make it easy for you. <laughs> it wasn't legal back then either. But there's the obelisks in 1970 comic book. Freaking crazy. And then they fictionalize a little bit. And they have one of these obelisks which creates some kind of gravitational field around itself. But Corey, look at this all this frickin' ancient space junk and bodies captured by the gravitational field of the obelisk in 1970. What do you think they might be telling us there? They're prepping us for either ancient builder race or some of the groups that came afterwards that built structures. Right. And the idea being that there's a lot of junk left behind on the moon, right? Oh, yeah. There's, it's covered in debris. So that's a very interesting thing. There's all this stuff going on, including back in 1958. Now remember, the NASA frame of that face that I showed you, that didn't show up until 1976. This is 1958. What the heck is this? Come on. How do you possibly maintain a skeptical opinion in the face of evidence like this? a 1958 comic that is called The Face on Mars, in which the actual shape and structure of the face itself, other than the fact that it's tilted up straight instead of lying flat, it looks freaking identical almost to the actual face on Mars. And then the whole story is, I talk about this in Ascension Mysteries, my new book, it's all about this ancient race that warred and blew up their planet. They talk about the asteroid belt being the remnants of this exploded planet. 
So I'm doing all this research. Hoagland's book totally blew my mind. I'm seeing there's ruins on the moon. There's ruins on Mars. Somebody's been out in our solar system for a long time. Then in 1996, I read this Law of One material, which the first book of which is called The Ra Material, because Ra is the name of the source. It claims to be a positive entity that helped the Atlanteans and the Egyptians way back when, and their message got distorted and confused, and they had to withdraw. Then they come back, and they were able to get through people that were actually doing intuitive channeling and get messages through. Now, in general, I don't really endorse channeling at all. I think it's kind of really taken a big downturn. But you read this stuff, it's like diving into some freaking scientific manual that has all this jargon and all this very interesting stuff going on. And Corey, we're about to get into the space program, but when you were in the program, did they know about this? Yes, absolutely. The, um, the rank and file were told that it was um, Luciferian and evil to stay away from it. Right. But the brass were encouraged to read it and, and a number of other books. So the thing that blew my mind is that there was so much stuff in this Law of One that matched up with the research I had gotten out of three years of reading probably 300 books. And it's a, it's a terrible shame because I left my computer behind when I moved from New York in the house that I'd been staying in, and I had a complete list of every book I'd read in college, and it was about 300. And I lost that file, which drives me crazy. Anyway, here's the cosmology, because it's not just all this weird stuff about ETs. It's a, it's a philosophy that they're teaching in this material, and it's very strange. It says that the only thing in the universe that really exists is identity, consciousness, meaning there's only one identity. There's only one consciousness in the universe. Then it basically says this cosmic consciousness became lonely or bored, something like that, and it decided to experience multiplicity. But the trick is it can't just sit there like somebody crazy in the corner with two puppets on his hands and ha 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 ha, oh yeah, yeah. It had to actually give each, each piece free will to be able to define its own curriculum. And so that law of free will becomes central to the whole discussion. The law of free will. Free will must be preserved for anybody in the universe, which means if you violate free will, you get karma. So one of the things that Corey found out in the course of his work, and remember, he's truly unique in the sense of being a whistleblower who actually was out there in a spaceship and managed to come back to Earth, recover his memories, and come forward as an insider. And he validated what so many other people had told me. And so he's actually out there flying around and remembered everything. And one of the things you said, Corey, is that, they, that these different space programs, they already have over 100 colonies in our solar system. And what are, what would, I mean, we have some art coming up in a minute, but what are some of these colonies like? What are we seeing? Well, the ones that are owned by the ICC, they are very sprawling. They have everything, they have areas to where they take raw materials, smelt them, break them down, create, um, you know, the raw materials to be put into whatever they're, they're building or manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Then they have manufacturing plants. They have the actual, um, the, the, the part of the colony where everyone resides. It's, it's just imagine any type of industrial program down here, it's pretty much mirrored up there. And we got some great art coming up, and I don't want to run too far out on that. So as he just said, there's mining facilities, and they have the living quarters fairly nearby. And you said that there's these truck kind of ships that they use sometimes to move? Yeah, these are very, for mining mostly, Right. very large, look like giant containers that you would see on a, on a ship. But they look kind of like big rigs strangely enough. But without wheels, yeah. Yeah, without wheels. But yeah, those I've seen those several times. And they're, they're usually transferring uh, things back and forth from the uh, mining operations. And so the mining could be occurring on any number of moons or asteroids in our solar system. Correct. It, it's happening on almost all of them because they all have unique properties. Interesting. All right. So we also know that there are multiple gigantic manufacturing plants just on the planet Mars alone. There's one less now. There's one less, yeah, after the, the Mars atrocity. Uh, so given that we showed people earlier in this talk the face on Mars, the pyramids on Mars, that stuff's obviously really old. 
Total Recall, very strange movie, right? They go in, and if you don't, if if you miss it, you could you don't see that at the end when when Arnold puts his hand into this thing, and all the cores go into the ice and melt that ice to create atmosphere for Mars. It all the water comes shooting up out of a pyramid. So if those pyramids are still there and Viking photographed them. Have we gone back inside? Have we seen what's in there? Have we can we use it? What's what's going on with those the face on Mars the pyramids? Well, most of what is on Mars is completely destroyed. You you you'll see. I mean, it looks like uh, what is it? Machu Picchu. The Machu place, Picchu. The or place Puma Punku. Puma Punku. Yeah. Where all the stones are just strewn about. Okay. You'll see. Sometimes you'll see like a corner of a block sticking up, and it, it looked like a pyramid. There, it's just it's destroyed. It's all so destroyed. there's really nothing to go in and look at when you go in there. Well, whatever has been, they have people that come, or not people, but non-terrestrials usually that come and pick through all of, okay, all of that and take what is uh, useful. But uh, yeah, we've found some things that that we've removed from these locations so you can imagine now i mean it's it's got to be frustrating it's frustrating for me right hearing all this stuff and going why the f are we not being allowed to see all this great stuff why are we being kept in the dark down here you saw the stuff on mars you really think that that's a trick of light and shadow you really think that those towers on the moon were just because oh well yeah the camera screwed up no, this stuff is real, and that's why I wanted to start with some really hard data, because Corey is not alone. We've been hoping that new insiders were going to come forward to corroborate this. We've got people that are starting to want to come forward now. We're getting more testimony, and it all crosses together. There's no way that all these people could be lying about this with all the data in the Law of One and all the provable things that we know. And so this is a really rare and amazing opportunity for us to learn about something that is so much beyond... And I don't want to insult anybody, but you all know, if you've been to UFO conferences maybe even as little as five years ago, oh, Roswell again? You know, oh, right, the saucer, look, it's metallic. Oh, my God. Come on, we're done with that. we got to actually figure out where, why are there so many different types of UFOs? Why do they all look different? And what Corey's revealing to us is he said, if you didn't catch that, it's very important, our people in the military-industrial complex space program, the, the greater one, of course, which is not really the military-industrial complex anymore, it's like a breakaway group, they're working with 900 different civilizations, and that's, as they told you, right, it's, that's the ones that they're really trading with the most. And yes, there are others they, as well, right? They were actively trading with over 900 non-terrestrial groups. But then there's other groups that are kind of sometimes trading with them as well, right? Yeah, yeah, they're sort of like nomadic almost groups, and they make right. it around to our area, and then we trade. So this is where things get really interesting. We're going to start with the one that Corey got introduced to first. As you've heard his story before, I'm sure all of you have. If not, go watch Cosmic Disclosure. We have a nice opening intro that you can see for free on blueavians.com, as he said, B-L-U-E-A-V-I-A-N-S.com. You can watch it free of charge. You don't have to sign up or anything. It had a huge number of views online. And he had done these programs in the space program, like we said, going and visiting these colonies. And then he gets pulled back in, starting on February 27th, 2015, only really about three months after we started to talk regularly. And he started to reveal all of his information to me. These blue avians, which he hadn't... You, you had had them contact you at home. That's one of your testimonials. And I remember you wouldn't even tell me about it. No. It was very personal, private to you. You wouldn't say a word about it. Well, for a couple of reasons. When I first got contacted by the Blue Avians, I was concerned because <laughs> I'd been in all these projects. I'd known about hundreds of different non-terrestrials. Not once have I heard about an eight-foot-tall blue bird. <laughs> Not once. <laughs> so, yeah, I was a little concerned. And uh, I definitely was not wanting to go around telling people I was talking to an eight-foot-tall bird, you know, when I, especially when I was just starting <laughs> to get to know them. Well, I can take anything. I mean, it's just, pour me three of those, bartender. Whew. Blue bird, got it. <laughs> Aliens. Just don't drink it at the airport. <laughs> exactly. 
Then, very shortly after they asked this Secret Space Program Alliance, they said, go get this man, his name is Corey Good. About three days later, two, three days later, I forget whether it was 28 or 29 days in 2015 or February, but you actually got... Well, I say teleported, but that was wrong. It was a it was a transport, right? You, that was when you had the dark craft, right? To this lunar operations command. Now this is brand new, world debut. You guys are seeing stuff nobody's ever seen before. Yeah, it's part of the graphic. You might need too. the live stream to really get a good view if you're way in the back. But this is what Corey. What are we looking at right now? <laughs> this is the dart. What I sometimes accidentally call a dodge dart. <laughs> 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 but it uh, it fits. Two crew in the front, and then in the back, there are three seats. Not a lot of room for cargo. It's just a transport. This was what was sent to Oops. my backyard to pick me up, to take me on to several different places, but uh, in, on this occasion to the Lunar Operation Command. So this is, you said two seats in the front, three in the back? Correct. And you mentioned before that a lot of people are getting picked up and they don't even know it because they're getting blank slated. Well, these with, people, these people that came up with me that during that time period were not blank slated. Okay. They came. They're they're back here on Earth. They, I don't know what their uh, mandate is. But you said this is really not much bigger than like a van, right? It's a yeah. It's it's about the size of a like a car. Okay. Yeah. And you said it kind of it kind of flutters a little bit when you step on it as right. you walk yeah, up. Yeah, the doors it. would pop up, and when I'd step in it, it would kind of, it would go down and, and slide a little. Like. Is this, Corey, a semi-accurate, at least, depiction of what you ended up seeing when you got up to this Lunar Operations Command, or LOC? No, this is actually one of the, the first, I guess, goes at creating the briefing room that I was in at the Lunar Operation Command. Okay. It was very much like what you would see at a college campus. Very, very similar. So th this is, I guess, more of a stylized view that we've sort of corrected since then. Okay. These guys are not, they're not wanting to keep this all secret from us, right? This meeting that you got brought to wasn't about keeping secrecy. It was about disclosure. Absolutely. Their man, the mandate of the SSP Alliance has been, it is time to disseminate all of these advanced technologies, but disseminate it in a way to where all of humanity is exposed to it at the same time, not just a small group of privileged. This is, this, I mean, this is their mandate. This is, they, they want full disclosure. The SSP Alliance is probably the only group out there right now that's still rooting for full disclosure. And, and I think we're going to get it. <laughs> I think we're going to get it. Okay, so the Sphere Being Alliance ties back into a bunch of actually visible things, and I did it last year. We're only going to do a couple now because people always complain, oh, my God, he repeated information. But what started to happen in the, in the late 1990s is that these gigantic planet-sized objects were seen around the sun, in some cases flying into the sun. Here's an example of two planet-sized objects colliding with the sun, and NASA says it's a complete coincidence that these things collide with the sun, and then the sun has an emission. And uh, I'm not even, we're not doing that. No, no, no semen jokes or anything like that. Okay. He tells the joke without telling the joke. I'm not going to tell you how stupid you are. It's the same, same kind of thing. Oh, they already know. <laughs> they already know. Look at this. This is an animated GIF file of two gigantic objects, it's fast, but you can see these two things go crash into the sun and the sun belches out this huge blast of light and, and fire. And NASA says, oh, those two events are completely unrelated. Okay, now what do they try to do? They try to say, oh, well, these are just a couple of comets. Okay, well, I don't think so. But anyway, here's one of the ones that's really stunning and there's a bunch of these and in the future, we're gonna present them all much more streamlined. We're getting to that. July 31st, 2002. If you look carefully, what you see here, this is, uh, there's, there's two white flecks. It's going to be hard to see this from the audience, but if you're on the live stream or you have it, you order it at home, you can see this. You see there's a white spot on the left and a white spot over on the right. Now, the white spot over on the right is a planet-sized object that is not supposed to be there. 
The one on the left is Mars. The one on the right is what this guy, Kent Stedman on cyberspaceorbit.com, he's now deceased. He was the guy following this. He was calling them sun cruisers. Now, you'll notice there's a white line through the middle of it. That is because it's so bright, it's overloading what's called the CCD sensor on the SOHO satellite that took this picture. There is no actual line around this thing. It is just a gigantic planet-sized object. And these things are flying around the sun. Now, look at this. The very next day, August 1st, 2002, remember, because it was July 31st, now it's August 1st, we go back, and there's Mars parked in the exact same position, and the planet-sized object on the other side is totally missing. And then a lot of times, this would happen, the SOHO would capture these, and then there's an accident. And the sensor breaks down. Oop, we got to take it offline. So, Corey, ah, oh, there's, there it is. I got to stop doing that, man. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> okay, so there it is. July 31st, you can see the little white dot on the right, and I'm going to hit it again, and boom, the very next day it's gone, but Mars is parked right where it always was. To and there it is again on the right, and notice where Mars is on the left here. It doesn't even move when I hit the button, but this other object disappears completely. Okay, so you were one of the ones that informed me that people were aware of these things, besides just guys on the Internet saying, oh, it's a, it's a big spaceship around the sun. What was the view on the inside when these giant spheres started to show up? Originally, when the spheres started to show up, there was a lot of excitement. They thought it was the return of the Sumerian gods and the people that they were very willing to worship and work with. But these spheres came into the solar system, parked, then cloaked, and then didn't answer any hails, any communications. So immediately... How many, how many spheres? In, in the beginning, it was like 100, and then they just kept on pouring in and pouring in. Mm. And they, they could tell that they were lining up equidistantly all throughout the solar system. So military-minded people are thinking, you know, this is an invasion. Maybe we should attack them. Let's get ahead to that slide because we have that here. That was one of the original art things that you commissioned. Yeah, it's really old. Yep. So the, the cool part is that when you actually get brought up there, some of what starts to happen is that you're getting these spheres actually showing up in your house. And ta tell us how that transport system worked. What was, what was the experience that you had? It is a, a blue sphere will appear in my house. A, a, an orb, and it'll zigzag around, like a, almost like a ping pong ball bouncing around, until I indicate that I'm ready for transport. Usually I have to take off like my electronic watch, I can't bring any electronics, so I, I prepare, and then I indicate that I'm ready, so I put on clothes. <laughs> there are many of the times I've, to I've told my, the stories about going different places, but I don't talk about my hair sticking straight up, and uh, <laughs> So I indicate that I'm ready to go. All of a sudden, the, the sphere just changes sizes to where it encompasses my body. And once I'm inside of it, there's, it's just a quick, it's almost like a, a blur or a smear. It happens so quickly. And then I'm at the location. And so this is not how most people are getting around in the space program. This is a very <laughs> unusual thing. Extremely <laughs> unusual, yes. All right, so the Blue Avians finally reveal themselves after all these years of the spheres not saying who they are, not responding to hailing signals. Then the Alliance in the Secret Space Program finds out about these guys and they ask for you by name. Right. The, the Blue Avians around 2011 started contacting both Gonzalez and I through dreams, which they have a protocol. They follow this protocol religiously almost. Right. So, yeah, I, I was getting that contact. They were sort of nurturing a relationship with me. They were doing the same thing with Gonzalez. And, at, and while they were communicating with him, he reported it to the SSP Alliance, who wanted more information, of course. But what had, what had occurred is they had gone to Gonzalez, the, the Blue Avians went to Gonzalez and stated that they wanted a certain person by name who he, you know, he didn't know who I was. 
after that, they they looked into my background. They found a lot of the SSP information. A lot of it was redacted, which is not supposed to be possible. So the, they they really wanted Gonzalez to be the ambassador, someone military, someone they can control. But instead, I was chosen. And, and he, I had no idea that he was in contact with the Blue Avians, and he had no idea that anyone else was in contact. Right. And so the Blue Avians, at this point, it was already well known that I had the show on Gaia and that we were actively looking for insiders who wanted to come forward. And this only happened to you right after you actually did use your real name and go public. That's a nice even, way to put it. Even though it wasn't something you wanted. Right. I was sort of outed unceremoniously, right. but yeah, yeah. But do you think that you coming forward with your real face, your real name, your real identity was part of the cosmic handshake that had to take place in order to allow this contact to occur? I guess it showed commitment. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So this is what you actually saw. And if you haven't seen this before, this is the art that we got from Andrew Jones, which was then turned into 3D. Yeah, that was turned into 3D by someone else. Yeah. And I was there as we constructed this, and it was very emotionally powerful for me. I actually broke into tears as this image was appearing. It moved a number of people in the room. Yeah, it was very intense, actually, when this was happening. And uh, so we're seeing a being that looks pretty human-like, but it's got small, fine feathers all over its body, right? That's part of, if, if we're correctly interpreting what we're looking at here, there's sort of these shiny, purplish-blue feathers, and then longer feathers that kind of act as hair, a very punk kind of hairdo. Right. New age, new wave. So um, then we have the golden triangle head beings, which have some unpronounceable name. Could you try to pronounce it? Or is it not even possible? I, I, I thought you, you went like <laughs> or something like that. Wasn't that uh, what? It? It's something really weird. <laughs> it's kind of almost like a screech and a. It's, it's weird. <laughs> So yeah. here's what they look like. Now, how tall was this guy? Ten feet. So he's even taller than Blue Avian because the Blue Avian, you said, is eight feet. Yes. And it looks like they're either there's a mirage in front of them or they're underwater. They're, they move very fluid-like, and they don't look like they have bones. And, I mean, kind of like an octopus. And then their toes and fingers, they have three, and they stand up on their toes like a tripod. And then, I mean, and their toes do this, and they kind of go up and down. It's very strange. Very okay, strange now, now w one of the first questions that the SSP Alliance asked the Blue Avian was what? Are you the Ra from the Law of One? And what was, uh, he said, are you the Ra from the Law of One? And what was their answer? Uh, uh, Tyr Air just had me answer back, I am Rao Tyr Air. No, Rao sorry. like Ra. Right, yeah, they, yeah, they pronounce it Rao. Okay. No. Which so, may, may be the way the original word was Yeah, we probably got it messed up, which we mess up everything on this planet, right? That's part of the game. <laughs> now, what's interesting about that, and it's kind of like their free will chess game, is that every time they're asked a question in the Law of One, their answer starts with, I am Ra. Correct. So it very much looked like that's what was going on. Now... I was really suspecting that this was the same Ra as the Law of One. And at home, so shortly after this happened to you, I was in my kitchen. You might have heard this story before. If not, I want to get it on record. I'm in my kitchen, and I say, "Is this? are these Blue Avians, in fact, the group that did the Law of One? Because it sure looks like it. And I asked the question telepathically, which is something we're going to get in tomorrow. For the first time, I'm actually going to talk about this. I've been doing this conference 12 years. I haven't talked about this stuff in 10 years. I'm going to talk about it tomorrow night. I'm finally coming out of the cosmic closet, okay, which is a lot worse than being gay. Being gay is not even a big deal anymore, which I'm not, okay, but everybody thinks I'm gay on the internet. Apparently, the military does too. That's fine, okay, but... <laughs> Saying that you can channel higher beings of I consciousness... I think thou protest too much. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going there. 
This could get into a big, big thing. So I had this experience of doing psychic readings, and I actually ran a business from 1998 to 2005 with 500 paying clients, people bursting into tears. I'm speaking on behalf of higher beings of consciousness, telling people things that predicted the future. There was one lady who had all these poems that she'd written. They actually started to quote from her poems, which I'd never even, I didn't even know she wrote poems. Not only did they quote from the poems, but they explained to her what they meant. So this was an experience I had. That's not you, okay. I was like, uh-oh. If he's doing that, something, I'm dying on stage, right? <laughs> they quoted from her frickin' poems, and this didn't just happen once or twice. This happened a lot. And so, of course, when I'm on the George Norrie panel tomorrow at 2 o'clock, he's obviously going to bring up, so, Edgar Casey, right? <laughs> oh, man, really? You going to do that again? Every frickin' time. Yes, I'm going to show you again tomorrow night the facial similarity of myself and Edgar Casey, because it's time. I, I've so many people don't want me to talk about this that Corey didn't even know about it. Believe it or not, when we actually did our last taping, I sat him down. I explained to him this whole Casey thing, and he hadn't even heard it before because I've totally avoided talking about it. So I was in the kitchen, and I still can get access. It's not as much as I used to do. I had some very bad things happening in my life, and I didn't dare try to do this. Because you have to have a really sacred consciousness or it's not going to work. You're going to get the wrong channel. And I did not want that. So basically after about 2005, I pretty much discontinued it. Because my life started to get really intense. And I didn't want to try my fate with the wrong side of the fence. But I can still get little things. And, and I'm trying to build it back to the point where I have the right consciousness to do it properly again. So I'm in the kitchen and I say, okay, are you guys the raw from the law of one? And I wait, and I listen, I meditate, I get deep, and I hear three words. Go outside now. You didn't answer the question. Are you the Ra from the Law of One? Go outside now. Sounds like a text you got from me at uh, Contact in the Desert. <laughs> That's similar, yeah. Third time. Are you the Ra from the Law of One? Go outside now. Okay, freaking fine, I'll go outside. Walk out the front, and I film this, and at some point I'm going to use the film. There is this huge freaking rainbow in the valley. This big full arc rainbow. And then another time later on when I ask the same question again and I'm on a walk, boom, I turn the corner and there's another big rainbow. And then Corey and I were talking about this. Remember this? We were at uh, a restaurant. I'm not going to say which one. We're in at Boulder. a restaurant in Boulder because it's like product placement if I give the restaurant name. We don't need to give them free publicity. But... Um, and we're talking about the same thing, and we freaking walk outside, and there's a double rainbow again. So it's happened three times. I was quite amused at uh, the people around's reaction when you started jumping up and down. <laughs> a rainbow, a rainbow. <laughs> double rainbow, dude. Yeah, interesting looks. Oh, my even in God. <laughs> yeah, one guy asked you, is that your God? <laughs> <laughs> That's right, he did. <laughs> he did, that was funny. And remember, there was a little girl in the restaurant that started, oh, the bird, the bird. Yeah. That was another really weird synchronicity. We get these weird synchronicities. And so I ask the question, and they say, go outside now, which seems like the rainbow is the answer, and the answer is yes. But again, it's like this weird thing where they don't really say it. Never a direct answer. But eventually, they did tell you flat out, yes, we wrote the law of one. And that's a huge development for me. Because it explains, okay, yes, they're the group. They're the ancient builder race. Law of One says they started on Venus 2.6 billion years ago. They built all these pyramids everywhere. They took off. They ascended. But now they become what's called the guardians, right? And they've come back in these giant spheres. So when these guys in the SSP Alliance were asking them, why did you come in these giant spheres? What's the purpose of this? What was their answer? To attenuate the energies that are coming from through the cosmic web through our sun. Right. Because we wouldn't be able to handle it in our current state. Attenuate means to kind of like control it and modulate it so it doesn't happen too much at once. Right. If they didn't use these spheres, and we're talking about the Mayan calendar end date, of course you guys all know, 2012 was a big flop. But look, the science was so good that I was going forward with this year after year leading up to 2012. 2012 was not a big flop. What was supposed to happen happened. We were just all wrong. Hmm. 
That's interesting. Yeah. That's also during the time that the sphere started coming in in mass into the solar system. So, you know, a lot occurred in 2012. It's all very congruent, this idea of ascension. I'm going to get way more into that tomorrow and on the Monday workshop. It's a huge subject about this idea that the sun's going to do a flash. And, Corey, you have still heard that there is going to be some sort of solar event that has a transformative effect on consciousness, but the date range now is more like 2018 to 2023. Is that still true? 2024. 2024. Yeah, okay. they, they added a year. So, look... All this stuff, if you've seen my scholarship, we have extensive documentation of so many ancient cultures predicting the sun is going to do something huge and that it transforms the very essence of what it means to be human. It totally ties in with the idea of the Tibetan rainbow body. There's 160,000 documented cases, as I always say, of people meditating for 12 or 13 years. If you can only have loving thoughts for 13 years, then you get to ascend anytime you want which is very difficult. <laughs> it took me two hours to get here in the traffic today in the rain. So we start the clock today. <laughs> and we'll probably start the clock again tomorrow and start it again the next day. Three-time best-selling author, star of TV, film, the one and only David Wilcock. All right. How's everybody feeling out there? Are you ready to rock and roll? All right. We now have absolute confirmation from four different sources on the inside that 47 top-level Washington, D.C. pedophile prosecutions are going to be filed next week. Uh, it's backwards, guys. <laughs> Can y'all read backwards? I don't know. I think we might have a technical glitch. <laughs> it looks good to you back there, but it doesn't look good to everybody else. I'm just gonna clue you in. <laughs> At least we got something. <laughs> Warts and all, the David Wilcox show. <laughs> How amazing is that shit? Now look, I'm not, I don't support what these people are doing at all. This is a very, very horrible thing. But as you all know, I've said this so many times, it's if you throw up, you'll feel better. <laughs> we can't change the fact that it's, that they're drunk. Okay, we can't change the fact that there's a sickness here. You're not, this is not something that we do on our own, per se. But it is something that must be dealt with when it, is coming to our attention, and so we don't go anywhere by being in denial. But one of the really great people who have been covering this is uh, a guy who worked for the Huffington Post, and he published a very popular video from Infowars on Huffington Post that was questioning Hillary's health. Because remember, she was having those seizures and stuff? Yeah. And they fired him from Huffington Post, and they deleted every article he'd ever written 
just for publishing this thing on Hillary. His name's David Seaman. And he's awesome. Okay, some of you know who he is. Well, I guess I can say this now. I sought him out, and I actually was able to make contact with him because he lives in Boulder, Colorado. And I gave him an enormous briefing, like four-hour briefing over dinner. And the guy's just like, uh, I mean, it was crazy. Oh, okay, well, got to run before you can fly. I think we're kind of halfway there now. Desktop, rear, ceiling, front. Oh, boom! Oh, shit! Yeah! It's happening. I told him, dude, I apologize, because this stuff is so weird. And you're coming at this as an academic. You're coming at this as somebody who wants the credibility. And I'm sorry that the truth is so freaking weird. But it is the truth, dude. I'm sorry, dude, but like reptilian aliens exist. <laughs> I'm sorry, but there's giants with elongated skulls and their skeletons have been found all over the planet. You can research it and you'll find out. The Smithsonian Institution would say, oh yeah, don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. <laughs> Smithson is the guy that founded the Smithsonian Institution, high-level Illuminati member. 33rd degree Mason, Smithson, yeah, Smithsonian. It's his organization. They were going around and they were grabbing these skeletons and according to one of my highest level insiders, uh-oh, that's me. <laughs> according to one of my highest level insiders, in the beginning they were literally taking these skeletons and dumping them out into the ocean because they didn't want anything to ever be found. So they're not, they weren't necessarily storing them. Then at a certain point, they realized, okay, we need to hold on to this stuff because this is our heritage. Now what does that mean? Well, that's what we get into this whole cosmic history of the Illuminati thing. It's very interesting. One of the titles that I've been tossing around for the Endgame Part 3 is Illuminati Beginnings and Endings. Because it's very interesting that this... Okay, look. Come on. If you've spent any time looking into Pizzagate, you know that it's not just about disgusting sexual practices. It's about... A, a freaking cult that does this because they have weird occult ceremonies in which they think that Lucifer is the good guy. Now, why do they think that? Because the God of the Bible created Noah's flood to cleanse the earth of whoever was here before and create what they call the Adam, which is us. We are the Adam. We are a race genetically created and seeded here, and we were given dominion of the earth. We were, and oh my God, David, you're talking about the Bible. <laughs> Judeo-Christian nonsense, mind wash, brain control. Look, I'm going to quote now from one of my really funny insiders, this guy that we call Bruce. It doesn't matter whether you believe it's true or not. <laughs> this is what they believe, and it's serious as a heart attack. <laughs> okay? So these people are really into the Bible. They really take this stuff in the Bible seriously, and we're going to see some of the hidden quotes that you don't usually find out about in what's called the Book of Enoch. When Corey Good comes into my life... You know, in October 2014, that's when I started to get all these briefings. It was soon followed early in 2015 after he revealed all this stuff about the secret space program to me, which most of you already know, and we're going to cover some of it again. I did a wonderful thing last night. How many of you saw it last night? Okay, did you like it? All right. I thought that was a pretty bomb-ass talk. Thank you very much. That's what I kept hearing. Everybody's like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. Yeah, I know. The truth is amazing. It's embarrassing to try to explain to somebody like David Seaman, who's totally new to it. It's like, well, 
Yeah, okay. Well, the military-industrial complex has 100 mining colonies throughout our solar system and many others, and they're working with over 900 different types of aliens. And <laughs> you got to kind of do the 10% rule. You give people a little bit, see if they can handle it, and then give them 10% more, 10% more. Don't just do a big freaking cosmic download without taking a breath. It's probably not going to work. <laughs> oh, I can do it. <laughs> So we have these beings show up, and we don't really know who they are. They show up only for the first time after they used Corey as their messenger. And Corey had just come forward with his real name as a result of circumstances outside of his control. And they immediately sound like the Law of One material. They have the bird-like appearance, and, and Ra in the Law of One says that they were that the hawk is their totem, it's their symbol. So right away, I'm thinking, okay, there's something going on here with the Law of One. And the first question that was asked by the Secret Space Program Alliance, the people that are now trying to declassify all this amazing high technology we talked about last night, that all of you, almost all of you seem to have seen it, so I don't need to repeat myself. And also, if you're watching the streaming, people get mad if you say any information twice. That's not new information. Okay. So we're just going to partition this up. So assume now that this is like a series, and this is part one. Tonight's part two. Monday night's part three. If you have the streaming, you can see it all. So these beings showed up only because Corey and I start talking, and they sound an awful lot like the beings described in the Law of One. And then, sure enough, we have William Henry come along later on, who sadly was not able to be with us this weekend because his wife has ended up in the hospital. It's very sad. But he points out, oh my God, here in Egypt, they have avian-headed humanoids that are blue, like, like uh, Horus right here. Some of them still have the paint on it where it's still blue. So these, are not, these beings are nothing new, and we didn't know this. That's the point. We put this intel out without realizing that Horus was blue. We put this intel out without realizing that Japan had what they call Tengu birdmen of the mountains that are blue avian humanoids. Okay? And this is only something I found out because of some research I did for ancient aliens. And then I was looking for things, and sure enough, I found out, okay, Tengu birdmen. I look up what they look like, boom, blue avians. And another, this is a Tengu birdman statue in Japan, so you can see... These beings were down there in physical form, and now they have statues made out of them. And then this one's kind of hard to see. But once again, if you look carefully at the head, this is a bird-like head on a human body. So it definitely appears that these beings from time to time will contact groups that are receptive to their message and uh, will actually get that message across to us in ways that uh, are very provocative because they showed up in these huge spheres. And all of this seems to tie back with my journey and how I ended up getting involved in all this because the first book I ever read was something that my grandmother gave me when I was five years old. And she's a fundamentalist Christian. And I said this last year, but it's worth repeating because it's so cool. It was called Strange Stories, Amazing Facts from Reader's Digest. And I couldn't even read. I was five years old, and it's an adult book. So I kind of used it like a picture book, and I'd flip to the back, and there was this chapter called Enigma of the UFO, and it had these really cool pictures of flying saucers, which I'd never heard of before, except that I was seeing them in dreams. Most of the time, I'd see cylinder-shaped objects. And then I'm seeing these things that I'd only ever heard about in my dreams in a book, and I'm like, what the hell is that go doing in there? It was amazing. So... But what even tripped me out even more was this article with Isaac Asimov as a co-author called Looking into the Future, and then this picture down here, commissioned by an artist where they're depicting a base inside an asteroid with these weird dart-like stealth craft going in and out of them. Now remember, this book was written originally in like 1978. That's when I got it, somewhere around there. The original edition is 1978. It was already in there by then. 
So something led these guys to postulate, and this is Asimov, right, a no, notable science fiction writer. Yeah, there might be asteroids with civilizations inside of them. Well, is he just a very original thinker? Apparently not. Apparently, we have people on the inside who are aware that stuff like this is already in our solar system with habitation inside. Now, it doesn't have a nice big gate in the front like that. You actually fly through the wall. You fly through the crust because these ships can dematerialize. So you go in, but there may also be some that have hatches or something. You go inside and you have a whole world in there, a whole civilization with people and water. Most of the moons we now know have liquid water inside of them. So this is pretty amazing because Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke are getting these little dribs and drabs of information and they leak it through fiction. And this was how this all gets started. Now the focus of the talk tonight is of course Antarctica. That's what you're here for. That's what has got our, in, our excitement right now. And this is one of the pictures, it's not really pyramids, but it's just a very cool couple of icebergs, which kind of sets the tone. This is taken in Australia, Antarctica. Woo! <laughs> so we can see how beautiful it would be to travel down there. And it's not as cold as they lead you to believe. You're not dying when you're down there. If you go during the right time, the right season, you'll get these gorgeous, gorgeous sunsets. And... There, this is actually a real picture. This is not photoshopped of a yacht that was found underneath the surface of the ocean in Antarctica. Somebody didn't have very good luck sail, <laughs> sailing during the wrong time. And to me, this kind of sets the stage for the ancient architecture and the things that we might see once we get down there. Why Antarctica? Because Antarctica is where the founding fathers of the people calling themselves the Illuminati supposedly crash-landed when they came to Earth and became what the Bible calls the fallen angels. That's a very important point. They believe that the fallen angels are real, but that because the God of the Bible wiped out their people in Noah's flood, that that God must be evil. Because this Adam, which is us, they call us the Adam, they think the Adam is wicked. And they think that they, with all their ancient knowledge and high technology that they crash landed here with, that they are the good guys. So they actually believe that they deserve to rule the earth and that we are not worthy. And so when I explained that bit to our Huffington Post journalist, David Seaman, that's when he got it. That's when he really saw, okay, this is why... These people are so sadistic that stuff like Pizzagate is actually happening because they see us as an invasion. Even though they invaded us, they believe that they have a right to the earth, that they belong here, and that we are the insufferable fools who shouldn't be here. So these pre-Adamites, after they blew up their planet, they survived for approximately 445,000 years on the moon. This is the latest, greatest intel. And so approximately 55,000 years ago, they got attacked by, guess who? The reptilians, the Draco. They had a terrible war with the, with the reptilians. That's how these ships ended up getting blown up. That's how the domes, that's how the glass got broken. Their ships were getting shot down. Only a very small number of them actually survived. Now, they started out, as I said before, 70 feet tall. But because the moon was so much smaller, they'd actually gotten a lot shorter over time. But they were still giants compared to us, anywhere up to 12 to 14 feet tall. They are badly, badly wounded. They only have a few ships left, and they crash-landed on Earth with those ships, which were gigantic in size, as we're going to see in a minute. And... The stories of their landing here were told in a book that should have been in the Bible, but the early Roman Empire said, there ain't no way we're putting this in the Bible because this is our story and we're going to be exposed if we put this in there. So they removed it, but it's as old as Genesis and Jesus quotes from it. So he clearly took it seriously. So the book of Enoch was discovered only in 1773 in Ethiopia Translated, we didn't even get to read it until 1821. 
Then they find out, wow, Jesus is actually quoting chapter and verse out of this book in the New Testament. And then chapters 1 through 36 are called the Book of the Watchers, and that's where the really interesting stuff says, it says to happen, and Enoch is actually Noah's grandfather. So these people on the inside believe that Enoch is real and Noah is real. These are real people, and these were real events. Noah's flood is the Atlantean flood, and it's older than we think. It was 12,500 years ago. So in the, in the book of Enoch, Enoch is basically working with these benevolent extraterrestrials, which very likely were the Blue Avians, same beings, and he's working with them, and he asks them if he, they will spare the lives of these people called the Watchers. Now, the book says there was 200 of these Watchers. I don't really think that's true. The data suggests there were a lot more. But there were a small number of these people that survived. They crashed here, and according to the new intel, they immediately set up cloning facilities and built lots of bodies for themselves so they could spread across the earth. And they crashed here 55,000 years ago. That's when this all started. So, the Book of Enoch goes on to say that the fallen angels created great giants whose height was 3,000 L's, Enoch 7.3, an L appears to be the distance between the elbow, hence L, and the tip of the middle finger, or a cubit, it's also called. And it's probably not really accurate because 3,000 Ls based on that would be like 450 feet tall. Okay, so it, it's, it's likely an exaggeration, but they were large, of course, we know they were large. This is probably something that was greatly mythologized by the point this book was written. It says in Enoch 7, 5 through 6, that the giants began eating people on earth. They were cannibals to the humans that were supposed to be here. They begged God for forgiveness. Enoch was used as their middleman. That's 13, 4. And they got turned down. And as a result of this, the biblical Atlantean flood, the Noah's flood was created to cleanse them from the earth. And they believe this is actual history. And in the Ascension Mysteries, I trace out all the different things that lead to this conclusion. Noah, the great-grandson of Enoch, became the guy who preserved the animals and plants and people, one of each species, right, so that we would survive through the flood. And this very likely is some kind of extraterrestrial craft. The Noah's Ark is kind of an allegory of a much more advanced object, and it just becomes a boat in this story because it's been rewritten and rewritten and rewritten, and people kind of missed the original point. So these pre-Adamites, this is what they looked like based on Corey Good's intel. These are the people who were deemed to be the wicked, the giants with the elongated skulls, where the flood largely wiped them out, but not completely. Surviving remnants of their population lasted through the flood, even though they were in much smaller numbers than the humans that were then seated here as the Adam. And those humans had already been here before, but then they were built to inherit the earth. So the Bible's a little bit off on that too. But the point is, these beings were not completely destroyed. When they survived in Europe and Asia, they eventually made their way into the Egyptian pharaohs, as I talk about in Ascension Mysteries. And when they first landed here, before all this crazy stuff happened, this is an important point that we get from the new briefings, they, know, they knew that the continent we now call Antarctica had ancient builder race ruins below the surface. It's a very important point. Ancient stuff, 1.6 billion years old is how old they estimate that it was. So their ships were badly damaged and they landed where they could then tear apart the ships, use the parts that were inside them, use the power systems, and set up their own little enclave because they were badly damaged. So then they colonized those underground bases built by the ancient builders. There were other places they could have landed that would have had better land and better water and better game, but they went to Antarctica because, at that time, it was tropical. The Earth had not shifted on its axis yet. It was a nice place to be because of the underground stuff that they were able to get into. That's where they started up all this cloning and all this crazy stuff. So now here we are. Oh, people are like, oh, don't show me his face. 
why in God's name did John Kerry go to Antarctica on election day? Literally, I'm not kidding. This is a picture of him traveling with the military on the day of the election. Like maybe he's worried that the election isn't going to turn out in a way that's good for Pizzagate people. Not saying that he is, but it's probably going to be. He wants to go see it while he's still got the chance in case Hillary loses. Here he is in Antarctica. Notice that he's not wearing gloves and a hat. It's warm enough down there that you can sail around and be comfortable. That's him in Antarctica. Why was he there? Because recently, as in within the last 30 years, according to some of my insiders, they found new ruins under the ice that are very advanced of these original ancient builders that crash landed there. And here is Buzz Aldrin. And there he is in the middle with his shirt that says, uh... Well, yeah, one of them says, get your ass to Mars. That's the one the woman is wearing. She's got the red bag. Her shirt says, get your ass to Mars. The other one says something similar. Destination. Destination Mars. Thank you. I can't really read it from here. Notice that they're on a Russian plane. You can't even charter an American plane in Antarctica. You had to go through Russia. And here it is right there on ABC, breaking news. Buzz Aldrin had to be evacuated from Antarctica. 86-year-old fell ill while visiting the South Pole. We didn't know why. And you're going to find out later, teaser, 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 you're going to find out why he had to be taken out. It's amazing. Wait till you hear that bit. And there he is. It's, it is actually true. If you watch the film Total Recall, Arnold actually does say at one point, get your ass to Mars. <laughs> and it's such a weird, stupid one-liner that it became a shirt. Now why, think about this for a moment, folks. Buzz Aldrin, 33rd degree Mason, goes to Antarctica advertising get your ass to Mars on his shirt in all of the pictures. What's the relationship between Mars and Antarctica? Well, they know. That's what I'm trying to tell you. This is not accidental. This is on purpose. And notice that Mars is embedded inside what? The NASA logo. Whoa. They know what they're going to tell us over time, and they have to hide it out in the open, right? They have to tell you what they're doing. This is what they're doing. Antarctica and Mars are connected. Antarctica is where the survivors from Mars finally ended up before they became what we now call the Illuminati. Those people crash landed here 55,000 years ago. For 5,000 years, they built a huge civilization in what we now call the Sahara Desert. It became very technological. They spread out across the earth. They set up kingdoms in every continent, every country of the time. They were the re leaders, the rulers. They had much bigger brains, much higher IQs, much better technology, and they subjugated the planet. And there was a catastrophe 50,000 years ago that wiped them out. And then they bounce back. And another catastrophe happens 25,000 years ago, wipes them out again. Then the third one was the one we associate with Atlantis. So that's how this works, and it's totally described in the Edgar Cayce readings. And there's so many things the Edgar Cayce readings has in common with this, it can't be an accident. So, Corey gets this incredible body of information. He wasn't telling me what it was. He just said, it's something about Antarctica, but I can't release it. And I mean, we knew there was ruins down there, but I didn't know that these excavations were so active and new. And then, finally, I get a briefing... And he can tell me, and this happens right before we're about to go for a Gaiam taping. And so we make it into episodes, and then we also integrated it into what became Endgame Part 1 and 2. Part 1, I go into Pizzagate. Part 2, I go into Antarctica. But not with all the rest of the stuff I'm going to tell you today. So if you've read Endgame 2, that will really help. Because I'm not going to go through all this again, I'm just going to repeat myself. But the point is... We start to release this information that they found these ruins in Antarctica. That the ruins were technologically advanced. That they found some very cool stuff there. And then we start to hear that there's a plan to release this. And this is actually part of what the Alliance wants to do. Now, I don't want to diss the Alliance. I think it's awesome that they've stood up against the Cabal. 
and they're bringing the cabal down, and they want to give us disclosure. But they're also saying this is the only responsible way to do disclosure because if you do it too fast, people will freak out. That's the excuse. The reality is that if we got full disclosure with the data dumps, all the data that there is, then the vast majority of everybody in the alliance has got unspeakable crimes associated with them because heroes can turn. You could have somebody working for Hitler in Nazi Germany who then becomes a defector and comes to the U.S. in this case. If you want to think of Hitler as bad, U.S. is good, even though ultimately, as I've said, the cabal seems to have been controlling both sides of World War II, and there's some really good data on that. Some people are going to be shocked when I say that, but not you guys. You're like, yeah, okay. U.S. Nazis, same thing. <laughs> right, got it. <laughs> no big deal. Nobody's like, <gasps> I don't see any faces doing that. So let's just go with this nice Victorian paradigm of US good, Nazis bad. We have a, you have a defector, you have a Nazi scientist and he gets compromised, he's part of that regime and now he's a hero, he's a whistleblower, he comes forward. So please, if you, if you are aware that this stuff starts to happen and this video ends up going all over the internet, Let's try to give these people some amnesty, for God's sake. If they are in the alliance and they're risking their lives to save our butts, they deserve a second chance because they are now heroes. Can I get an amen on that? Yeah. All right. We have to be able to practice the forgiveness that the ancient teachings of all major religions tell us we should be doing. We have to be able to see that these people are not lizards and they're not monsters and they're not creatures. They're human beings who might have gotten stuck in something really bad. Some of the stuff that Corey Good was involved in was really bad. He's admitted it on our show. But he's a hero because he came forward. There's other insiders that have come forward. But the Alliance has pushed this thing out because, and this is the real story, they all want to die before the stuff would come out that would cause us to judge them. They want to die a natural death. They want to live out their life. And I understand that up to a point. I do understand why they would want to push this thing out 50 years, maybe even 100 years. And drib and drab it out, okay? But here's the thing. Our planet does not have that time. What the hell did we just hear about Fukushima? Right? It's freaking 560 whatever sieverts per hour, which means that the robots would break down in two hours. A human being exposed to it for a flash is instantaneously dead. The, we have technology that can dial out that radiation like nothing ever happened. It's already there. That's known. The good old insider Henry Deacon told me that people that go into space, they have a little pill that you can take. And once you've taken this pill, you're essentially immune to radiation. You can get a massive dose and nothing happens to you. They have these very thin coatings that they can put on the outside of ships, even including our own NASA space probes. They had them too, because otherwise those guys would have been hash browns inside there, literally. That's why people say, oh, we never went to the moon. And one of the reasons, radiation from the sun would cook you if you don't have the atmosphere. Well, yeah, that's true. But what they don't know is that it was coated with this special polymer that totally shields radiation. So we have the technology. So look, you guys, I understand and I get it. You don't want to have embarrassing information. There's going to be a witch hunt. You probably will have to be, if this does happen with full disclosure, okay, you guys are going to have to end up going somewhere that you're safe from the torches and pitchforks of the masses. I get that. And I apologize because people will be like that. They're not going to like what they hear. But I will be one of the ones supporting you as heroes and saying that you deserve clemency. And this audience also, as you've just said, how do you feel about them being heroes if they're going to save the planet for us? Absolutely. They need our support. They need to see that we're not going to see them as creatures and monsters, that we're ready for the truth, even though it's going to hurt. And this truth is something that they very much know to be true. So we get this briefing from the Space Program Alliance because people at that level where they've got all this really advanced technology, they want the whole disclosure to come out. 
And that's what we're fighting for. I believe that we will heal from this, and when these people in the Alliance are kept in safety, that they can eventually be forgiven and brought back out, and we're not going to try to kill them. Because the things that we're going to get as we get full disclosure will quickly make us capable of forgiveness. Because imagine if instead of having to drive home tonight, you just portal back home. If you have a little pocket portal, boop, off you go. That really didn't sound good. I promised I wasn't going to do a dick joke. That's two of them. Wow. It's hot in here. Can you imagine being at home, having a portal device in your home, and getting to travel out to a base on Pluto and come back in time for dinner and get to meet all your cool new friends who are ETs and get to see things that are so spectacular that you're literally shedding tears in amazement at what you're looking at. If we get to that point where you have a materializer in your home and you think about the best meal you've ever had in your life and you hit the button and boom, there it is, perfect. And it digests into pure nutrition in your body, cleans your mouth as you eat it and leaves no waste products behind and you don't get fat, you don't lose your teeth, you actually gain dental health, I think we'd start to feel a little more forgiving. If you got anti-gravity and you have your hoverboard that's a real hoverboard, not the frickin' thing that blows up under your feet. <laughs> we saw this guy smoking weed on his hoverboard. <laughs> it's true, it actually did happen. <laughs> Got to have fun with this, right? It's really hot in here, so we'll try not to touch my nose. Remember the other videos where I'm always doing this all the time? It itches, but I'm not touching it. <laughs> People say, oh, David's on cocaine, man. Frickin' did lines. That's why he talks so fast. No. It's blisteringly hot in here, okay? Even up there, you can feel the heat. It's like, it just radiates down from the ceiling. There's a lot of bodies in this room. So, we do all this intel. We get all this stuff put together. And the Alliance people are pushing Corey like crazy, which means he's pushing me like crazy. We've got to get this out. We've got to get this out. We've got to get this out. And remember, the Alliance doesn't want us to release all this because they want to do this over the course of 50 or 100 years. The Earth Alliance doesn't want us to do this, but the Space Program Alliance does, and the beings, the sphere beings, want us to do this. So we got different factions that are trying to help the planet, but some of us want us to do one thing and others vociferously oppose. So we're going with what the Space Program people and the sphere being people have told us they want. And you have to trust that these are benevolent people, especially the higher beings, and that if they're advocating for this, that it's going to work out, and we're not going to have all the Alliance people killed in a genocide. It's not going to happen. Once you have that technology, once you have anti-gravity, once you have a car that you can fly through the air, point and click, you never have a car accident again, you can go anywhere you want, you can travel all over the cosmos, you can see incredible ancient ruins. If you want to, archaeology is probably going to become one of the most common jobs people take on. Right? Because we're not going to need money. You're not going to need to work a job. You're going to do something because you love it. Because you're passionate about it. Isn't that awesome? I would definitely get my ass to Mars. I want to see those pyramids. I want to see that face. I'm going to put on my spelunking hat with a little light on it and a pick, and I'm going to be in there freaking looking for stuff. There's entire areas inside the earth of ancient cities that they've barely even explored because they don't have the staff. With all this technology just sitting around waiting for us to look at. They need the numbers, they need the population of people who are going to be proactive enough to want to investigate this stuff. That's a good thing. The way that society will change is so dramatic we can barely even imagine. And how exciting it is for me to be standing on this stage with you tonight disclosing what may be the very last stages before we finally get the truth.
Amazing. Ah, oh, David's a conspiracy theorist, man. Nothing's ever going to happen. He's just lying. He's just trying to sell books. Yeah, right. Like, selling books makes a lot of money. The publishing industry is basically dead. I still do it because I want to get information out, but it, it's basically, when you add up the hours that it takes, it's almost not much more than minimum wage, really, honestly. And I'm one of the top-selling authors, so anybody else who's writing a book, you know, please help them buy their book because they need it, okay? It's like nobody makes money writing books anymore. It's almost a d dead art. So, if this was just a story, just a conspiracy theory, it doesn't explain, okay, why did Buzz Aldrin go down there? Why did John Kerry go down there? Why did the Pope go down there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is all the, the black Pope, right? All, all the, some of this is classified. A lot of these people didn't go on a public basis. But they're all going down there. They're all really excited about this. So we're told, hurry, 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 hurry. And it freaked me out. I mean, I, I worked my butt off. And we got it out on December 11th. And literally, I am not kidding. Well, this is the video that we made a few days later. And it was wildly successful. Over a million unique views. So this really got out to the public big time. Two hours after my article came out is when the first thing showed up. <laughs> and... Big plug here, if you go to dwilcock.com, the actual mixed and mastered MP3 of Endgame is available. You just put your email address in, it's free, you can listen to it in the car. It's awesome. And also, thank you. And it's really important to, to do those emails because they have been hacking my site like crazy. Somebody, we had to turn off the entire discussion forum. We had to delete 10 years worth of, well, we have it in the hard drive on our server, but we had to take it offline. 10 years worth of everybody's discussions because somebody put malware somewhere in there and Google says, oh, your site links to malware. You must be hacked. Oh, we're going to ban you. So this is how they take your site offline. All you got to do is have a discussion forum or a comment section and one thing goes in and you're done. Two hours after we put this article out, tabloids start saying exactly the same thing, and it ended up on the front page of Drudge Report. Now, here's the shrinking reindeer from global warming, which is a sad story in and of itself. But then there it is in italics. The lost city of Antarctica, massive ancient civilization, lies frozen under ice. Holy shit. <laughs> Two hours after my article comes out? Is that a coincidence? <laughs> Come on. No. This says the lost city of Antarctica. Shock claims massive civilization exists beneath a mile of ice. Antarctica is hiding a huge city underneath more than a mile of ice, according to incredible claims. December 11th. Artist's impression of a doorway to Atlantis. They're getting you ready. And we were told, you've got to get this out before you get scooped. And look, there it was, two hours later. Unbelievable. They talk about the Piri Reis map, and they say, look, it's got the subglacial topography of Antarctica before they were supposed to know what it was. And they quote from Charles Hapgood, the guy, the original guy that had the theory that the Earth shifted on its axis in space. Antarctica was originally not on the pole, but it was tropical, and it moved. What they didn't get into was this interesting fact that you can look at Antarctica now, and, and if you look at the top of this image, it says subglacial lakes. So these blue areas are beneath the surface of the ice. The surface is all white, and you just see ice. But if you go in there, they know that there are areas where there are lakes, meaning this warm water. And you can take a look and see where the lakes are, meaning this is where the continental masses are, and where... Two chunks of Antarctica, there's a big chunk on the right, a littler chunk on the left. We only knew that since 1958. There's another image of it in gray. But yet, here we have from 1754, the Buachi map from the Vatican showing Antarctica with a channel in between the middle right where those subglacial lakes are. So what the heck is going on here? They knew. Antarctica wasn't even discovered until the late 1800s. 
This is all going to be part of the disclosure. It was mapped back when it wasn't frozen. Back with the pre-Adamites. They copied this over from pre-Adamite books. That's how they got it. That's all part of the disclosure. Then the next day, December 12th, 1212, important ritual date, the lost city of Antarctica. Shock claims massive ancient civilization lies frozen beneath a mile of Antarctic ice and could even be Atlantis. Isn't that something? Just one day after we were rushed to pu publish this thing, and I broke my butt doing it. There it is. Now, this is what it says in that article. Check this out. There's the link, so you can look it up yourself. Conspiracy theorists went wild earlier this year when a video claiming to be from the lost city emerged. Now, wait a minute. Is anybody here realistically going to deny that I'm not one of the greatest conspiracy theorists of our era? <laughs> I sell books. I do conferences. We've got a huge crowd here at Conscious Life. I'm definitely one of those people. I didn't go wild because there was no video. They make this stuff up. They're leaking a fake story. It's fake news. But it's actually getting us ready for something that's very real. <clears throat> this alleged video that nobody ever actually saw, they just say, oh, conspiracy theorists, but you don't know who they are. They don't post a link. They don't show you the video. They don't give you any way of seeing where this video is or who wrote about it. They don't link to one article of anybody who said anything about this. Oh, just take my word for it. Yeah, the, the conspiracy theorists went wild. It appeared to show extensive ancient ruins hidden in the ice and was a video supposedly left behind by a California TV crew who have been missing since 2002. <laughs> now, this is what's so crazy, and it's one of the things that we really have kicked ourselves for, is that Corey had told me, before they wrote this, that there were teams down there that had been embedded since 2002 filming the archaeological ruins, getting ready for this disclosure. They've been doing it all that time, 14 years. And then this comes out a couple days later. I was kicking myself that we didn't leak that part of the intel in our article. Because it was so amazing. So I put it in as an update after this happened. So though that crew is still down there now. They've been making documentaries for 14 years. And notice it's the year after 9-11. They needed this plan in case the botched job of 9-11 got exposed. And then they need to get a get-out-of-jail-free card. They need to say, oh, well, look, everybody, you know, yeah, we did some bad stuff, but hey, now we're going to give you something good. Can't you be nice? Can't we all kiss and be friends now? That's the Cabal's plan. Now the Alliance wants to actually release this as part of a benevolent disclosure. The only thing we're disagreeing with them on is how fast we get it. But they're setting the stage for that real disclosure with this right here. So then it goes on to say, archaeologist, archaeologist Jonathan Gray claimed that the U.S. government is trying to block the video from being seen because it reveals there is a massive archaeological dig underway two miles beneath the ice. But that's not the wildest claim, with several online websites claiming, wait a minute, what website isn't online, dude? Online websites, hmm. <laughs> it's not exactly well written. Several websites claiming that there is a city in Antarctica and Hitler knew about it, making it a secret Nazi base. Now look at this. What they're doing is they're setting up the release of this video. They're promising something they intend to deliver, folks. They intend to deliver a video that shows a massive archaeological dig two miles beneath the ice. That is going to happen. This is the proof. It happened right after we published our intel. Is this a coincidence? No way. Then in the same article, they say, oh, by the way, we just found a Nazi base in the Arctic. Not Antarctica, but they show you a Nazi base in the Arctic. But then I did some research, and I start looking up, okay, let me just see if anybody else did something on Antarctica is Atlantis. The mainstream scientific journal, known as Science, as, as good as it gets in academia, published this very strange thing in 1998. Check this out. There it is. There's the Science logo, AAAS. 
And look at the bottom. March 31st, 1998, ancient ruins found in Antarctica. Now, the first clue that something's wrong here is you got this little image of a guy dressed up in old-fashioned Shakespearean clothing, and he goes, oh, please. Okay, but that's about the only clue you get at first, that something's wrong. Ancient ruins found in Antarctica in a mainstream scientific journal. And here's the text, which I'm now going to read to you. Check this out. From 1998. Argentina. That's the first clue something's wrong. Why would it be... And is there even a place called Dirac? Okay. It's, it, it ends up being a spoof, but they're hiding things in jest. Scientists... This is in Science Journal, Okay. Scientists have uncovered the remains of a massive stone structure and other artifacts estimated to be 4,000 years old in a remote corner of Antarctica. The find announced at a press conference here today is the first evidence of ancient civilization on the icy continent and is being hailed as one of the most important archaeological digs of the century. Working in dwindling light just before Antarctica's first sunset of the year in mid-February, a team led by geologist Scott Amundsen of Wyoming State University came across the rubble of a stone building roughly the size of Rome's ancient amphitheater. Hmm, interesting. One of my students tripped over a squat pentagonal block while we were hiking up near Doubleday Glacier, Amundsen says. And in fact, the briefings are saying that the melting of the ice in Antarctica is causing these buildings to poke out now. This is actually real. All the stuff they're telling you here is true. And they're preparing you for the disclosure that they might have done right after 9-11 if they needed it, which is why they sent those guys down in 2002. This was setting that up back in 1998, four years in advance. They knew what they were going to find. Doubleday, the glacier, has been receding at an estimated three meters per year for the last century, and the last geologic expeditions that they are going to talk about visited it in the 1920s. Previous researchers could have easily missed it, Amundsen says, because there wasn't very many of them. The team worked deep into March, well after the normal end of the field season. So far, the researchers have uncovered the foundations of a massive columned structure that may have stood as high as 30 meters, says group member Harvey Sampson, who last, here it comes, who last year had proved by DNA analysis that Piltdown Man was not an elaborate hoax, but in fact the skeleton of the murdered St. Nicholas, the last Russian czar. Science Now, April 1st, fuck, 1997. April 1st, April Fool. They loft the big middle finger. And it goes on, and they say all kinds of stupid, crazy stuff then. It's all joking, ha, 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 ha. That part makes me angry, so I did not include it in the talk. But the point is, they joke about it. They, oh, April Fool, April Fool, in a mainstream science journal, talking about ruins in Antarctica. They tell you the truth, but then they disguise it. Isn't that amazing? Can I get a big round of applause if you think this is amazing? <laughs> Unbelievable. <clears throat> Then, the article that came out two days after, one day after we published Endgame 2, links to this, Hitler's Ghost Island, secret Nazi treasure hunter base in the Arctic, found by Russian scientists after being abandoned over 70 years when the crew was posen, poisoned by bad polar bear meat. That'd be a pretty rough meal in the first place, I don't know. <laughs> And it says, a top secret Nazi base in the depths of the Arctic has been found by the Russian scientists after more than 70 years. It's located in a remote island in Russian territory, more than 600 miles from the North Pole. And here's a rusted shell. All these things, they have all these pictures of what they found there. So that's getting us ready that the same thing could be in south of the pole, the south, south Pole. We have William Tompkins now, who has come out as our big new whistleblower. Here he was as a young man, hired in World War II to debrief American scientists embedded in Nazi Germany's space program including people that were working in Antarctica. And he confirmed that these ruins were known about all the way back in the late 1930s. They've had a long time to prepare for telling us the truth, which is really stunning. Now, what we're hearing from Corey is that not only is it Antarctica, they're finding that some of the ancient ruins on Earth have very technological things like portal devices actually buried inside the stones, including some of the oldest Sumerian stuff. And this is one of those examples 
So we're going to have to probably protect this stuff when that comes out because people are going to want to tear them apart looking for technology. And they've been very quietly doing this with very advanced equipment to find these things and try to get them out before they tell us about this. But they're finding all kinds of cool stuff in there. And while looking at these ancient ruins, I came across this. Those are two ordinary humans of ordinary height, two men, holding, like slaves, an umbrella for a very tall human being. Isn't that interesting? A pre-Adamite. One of these elongated skull guys. One of the giants. There's more proof. One of the things Corey's intel has told us is that they are going to show us rooms that are just literally lined with gold, floors, walls, and ceilings with all this gorgeous inlay. And Corey actually got to see that stuff. And so there's this place, I believe it's in Indonesia, called Baudang, that has a very similar type of a look to it. Not exactly the same, but close. And people go there to pray, and of course all that gold is going to have amazing energy. It's going to be a very energetic spot. You can see how beautiful this is. Corey was picked up by a craft like this, and that's one of the ways that he got taken to Antarctica. This is from the MIC group, the Military Industrial Complex Secret Space Program. And when he was down there with the Anshar and with other things, this is a forensic reconstruction of what it looks like in one of the real bases. You got these triangular craft down there, all kinds of excavations going on. And then this is the art that we commissioned for Endgame 2. This is what they actually do. They're digging holes through the ice, and you see these buildings down there. So I'm going to zoom in selectively on certain parts of this. If you look carefully, you can see there's an obelisk up at the top in the ice. And then there's these ruins, which he said they do look like Pumapunku in Peru. And specifically, the briefing was that Pumapunku was sort of like an extraterrestrial UN. A lot of different groups met there. And this was very likely another place like that. These ruins, this is sort of what we're going to see when they first release it. Something like this. You notice there's a bulldozer in there. And then they got a little tunnel in the back. And there's rails going up. And then when we go down from there... We see this little guy on the left. That's a steam blower. It generates steam, and they use that to melt the ice. And then you see on that wooden cart, they're hauling out the body of a mastodon. So they're finding lots of prehistoric animals underneath the ice. And they're also finding all these pre-Adamite bodies. Now, isn't it interesting that the Cabal, the largest object in Washington, D.C., is the Washington Monument, an obelisk, an Egyptian obelisk which is an emulation of stuff that's over 2 billion years old that's all over our solar system and beyond. They still worship the same gods. They still have the same religion. They keep building the same structures in honor of the very oldest stuff they ever found. That's not an accident. Just like the Statue of Liberty is the female goddess Isis, her torch is the sacred mystery schools. They must keep the flame lit. Just like in the Olympics, they always got to have the Olympic torch burning. They never let it go out. And then her book is the book of the sacred mystery teachings. And then the crown, the rays coming off her head, is the fact that she's ascended. She's a god or goddess. So they hide it out in the open with things like the Statue of Liberty, which is the female version, and the obelisk being the male version, because this is their religion. It's a mystery school religion. So... These pre-Adamites bred with people, regular people on Earth, and they had a whole different... There were different types of hybrids they made, and some of the hybrids were human size height, but retained the elongated skulls and had less hair. And this includes Egyptian pharaohs. This is uh, Akhenaten and Nefertiti's daughter, Meritaten. Notice she has no hair and a very elongated skull. I've talked about this extensively. There's the family of Akhenaten, Nefertiti, and their kids with all the pre-Adamite features. They were the survivors of this catastrophe after Atlantis. They didn't all die. Some of them lived in Europe and Asia. Some of them lived in the Americas. They didn't actually form back into contact with each other until approximately the 1600s or 1700s based on ships that crossed the Atlantic. But they went into hiding. They, they were the gods in, in Mesoamerica as well. And then when the conquerors came, they fled into the, into the jungles and underground bases they still had. And they hid out. And then they eventually migrated back over to... Europe, and they all pretty much now seem to be living in the Vatican, but they still have warring factions. The beings that have been found under the ice are mummified. This is actually a real mummy, not one of the pre-Adamites, obviously, but this is, what, this is kind of what you're going to see that they look like. 
And this is Pompeii, and so Pompeii, of course, is where volcanic gases of very high temperature flash burned everybody, and they immediately died, and their images were captured in the, in the ash. And so this is real people that were captured that way, and so they're calling this Pompeii under ice. <clears throat> One of the crazy things, now this is a sculpture, okay, it's not real, but they find all kinds of chimeras, half-human, half-animal hybrids, which is exactly what Edgar Cayce's readings said the Atlanteans were doing, and as part of what made them wicked and caused the flood, is you're not supposed to do this. They were hybridizing human DNA with animals, and then they were creating these slaves that they used for work. And they were treated very, very badly. So some of them had a bull, the centaur. Yeah, it's funny, yeah. I mean, I put that in to make you laugh, but... The point is, why do we have all these records of this stuff? Because people saw them. They were real. They all died out eventually. But for a time, these beings did exist. So we still have the records of them. When you actually go into the real stuff deep underground, this is the kind of things you see. These gorgeous pillars with light all up and down. And one of the things from Corey's briefing was that one of the plans that they have for partial disclosure is that they will tell us about ETs. And the first group they were planning on telling us about is called the Tall Whites. And this is what they look like right here. Charles Hall is the whistleblower who's gotten into this. Now they were hoping, this is more the cabal groups, hoping that they could introduce us to these guys, force us to learn a brand new language, that's the Tall White language, and force us to learn their religion, and then basically worship them as our gods. Good luck with that. I don't think that's going to work. <laughs> But that's one of the things they hoped for. So this is brand new art that you're probably going to see it again tomorrow. Corey allowed me to use it for this talk. These are Anshar egg-shaped craft, the Anshar of the Inner Earth Alliance that we talked about last night. Nobody's ever seen this until right now. They're gigantic. Now look at the size of these eggs, and there's little uh, stairwells going into them, and then there's people way, way down at the bottom. Okay? And I'm going to zoom in on those people even more. You can get a sense of the enormousness of these craft. Why is it not wanting to do that? Okay, well, there they go. Okay, let me back up again because I went through that too fast. So these are huge craft that are egg-shaped, obviously anti-gravity, and Corey was taken down there on an expedition, and this is what he saw. Over in the background, you have an excavation site, so we're going to zoom in on that first. The excavation site has trucks, steam blowers, and then you'll notice that what we're seeing here is some kind of obelisk or pyramid that's being steamed out of the ice. Notice the point of the pyramid. You see that? The white pyramid sticking up with the beams po pointing at it and all the steam around it. That's what he was seeing. And then over here where the snow is on the bottom, we have people walking up out of the craft. Corey was one of them. And there's the building poking out. You see that corner on the right. That's the corner of a big stone megalithic building. And they had already been pulling out pre-Adamite bodies, and they'd laid them out on the ice, because this is a new expedition. This is new archaeology they're doing here. So what they see there is, is these bodies of giants wearing these curious outfits, and Corey got to see them up close with the mummified look that I told you before. And he said these bodies were really thrashed. Because remember, these people died in a flood. And then if that's not bad enough, with earthquake and flood, then they freeze and are frozen into ice, which becomes Antarctica. So this is what he saw when he was there, and nobody's ever seen this until right now. So, all of this was fascinating enough on its own. And then, I called up Pete Peterson, and I had a dialogue with him on the phone about what Corey had told me, but I didn't really want to tell him anything. I just said, what do you know about anything interesting going on in Antarctica? And boy, oh boy, did that open up the bottle. Uncork the bottle and pour up a nice big drink. Holy smokes. So, the first thing that he told me when he started the briefing dealt with 15,000 human bodies. And this is a, a, a morbid but true thing that I'm authorized to tell you. I'm not really sure why, but let me get this pointer out of the way here. Put that down there. He was told that he was called and asked what to do for 15,000 dead bodies and explained that they were casualties suffered after the Alliance was going after underground bases. 
So what this means is that the alliance is to try to save the planet, to try to stop these people from trying to kill everybody with nukes or viruses or economic collapse or any of the things they're trying to do. The alliance has been on, a, on an industrial scale getting everybody in these underground bases to either surrender or be wiped out. And some of them are getting wiped out. And so they call Pete up and they say, hey, Pete, you're the expert. We got 15,000 dead bodies. What should we do with them to get rid of them? And you got to understand, military guys can joke about stuff like this. So what he told me was that they've called in the Canadian Marines for some of these bases, and they've run through half a trailer of ammunition. So there's a big shooting war going on. This is the World War III. It's just all happening in these places we're not supposed to know about. It's going on right now. That's a great deal of damage. Half a trailer of ammunition is a ton of ammunition. It is set up so that individual soldiers do not know whether they fired real rounds or blanks. And he said this was also done in World War II to reduce psychological impact. Now, I've heard people think this is not true. Then he told them, okay, get an LST boat. It's a military boat. You can fit 120 Abrams tanks in one of these LST boats. So it's very large. Let me get this thing out of the way. 500 troops can fit in one of the boats. And you can sail the bodies out to sea, fit them up with concrete galoshes, and feed the sharks. So that was his brilliant idea about how to get rid of 15,000 bodies. So this is how the briefing starts. You can see we're already, like, really in the ozone layer here. Very strange stuff. And again, it's morbid, but this is a real war. And what they're doing is they're cleaning up all this stuff first before we ever hear about it so that there's not going to be a whole lot of work left to do on the surface. And by the time we actually get disclosure, they've already solved most of the problems and the war has been won. Isn't that interesting? And that's a good thing. That's a good thing because what that means is the rumors that we've heard over the years about the destruction of underground bases is true and that it's now gotten to the point where the cabal is almost completely gone. There's just a few little remnants left and they're being wiped out as we speak. It's amazing. And, and he's telling me this just a few days after it starts raining in California. And it's eliminated our drought. That's the alliance too. I've been telling everybody that I know online and my friends, when we see it rain in California for days at a time, that's when we know the cabal's been defeated. And that's what's happening. It's fantastic. So he said that's been happening. This is Corey's confirmation. He said that people have been locking, this is what Corey said after I told him what Pete told me, people have been locking themselves inside these protected underground facilities. The Alliance is cutting through the doors with blow torches. They're arresting people and removing them off the premises, but if they resist violently, then a shooting war results. And Marine Expeditionary Forces are clearing out the bases. One of the problems that happened according to Pete and Corey, is that some of these Marines were not vetted out on extraterrestrials, and they go into these underground bases and they see 8-foot or even 10-foot, 12-foot tall reptilian, demonic-looking beings fighting against them with guns. And the psychological shock has been huge, so there's a lot of these soldiers that are now in counseling because <laughs> they were shocked to see these non-human Dracos. Now, I'd start to ask him about the underground cities that he's talked about before, because this is where these people are hiding, that they're now going in and invading. He said a normal underground city will house 40 to 45,000 people. Some bases are there to protect people who aren't even there yet, meaning the bases are empty, and they plan on having people from the surface go down there to be saved from cataclysms. He said that they've got this Mount Timpanogos underground base where they've already set up his apartment. They're trying to get him to go down there, but he stays on the surface. They insisted that he have one eight months ago. This was in January. And what they're planning on doing at some point is saying, hello, folks, guess what? The sun is changing. At 32,000 feet, you are now getting the equivalent of a chest X-ray in an airplane every eight minutes. Now, they're not telling us this yet. So flying is becoming a problem. You're allowed two chest x-rays a year. They are hiring flight crews like they're going out of style. So apparently they're trying to keep this covered up, but people in flight crews that are on airplanes all the time are getting 
cancer a lot faster because they're getting all these x-rays. And this is because the sun is doing its thing. So, you know, I'm trying not to travel more than I have to. I'm getting all these invitations to conferences, and after knowing this stuff, I'm like, you know what? I think I'm good. <laughs> Take my little two-hour flight to Boulder, and I'm happy. Once in a while. And it's a kind of a lower-altitude flight anyway, so that's even better. They're trying to fly at lower altitudes now to prevent this from being worse. Now, I ask him a question. Benjamin Fulford recently reported that all of the U.S. aircraft carriers have been brought back into port at the same time. And he said, yes, that's true. This is happening in Portsmouth, Newport News, Savannah, North Carolina, Camp Lejeune. I don't know how to pronounce, spell that, but that's how, that's phonetic. Lejeune, okay. Camp Lejeune, small bases in Alaska, San Francisco, Long Beach, which is down here below L.A. All the ships are in. A lot of them were out because of what is going on in the Middle East right now, this, this war with the Alliance versus the Cabal and ISIS, which is the Cabal's cutout army. It takes six months of 24-hour-a-day work to replenish a full aircraft carrier. You can house 7,000 people on these carriers, and there are two new ones now that can hold 12,000. You have to fly the planes in to these aircraft carriers from military bases, then they have to land on the carrier. You don't, you don't roll them in, you fly them in. The reason that these carriers are all being called in now is to load on weapons that we've never admitted to and that they're not, they weren't going to tell us about these weapons for the next hundred years. But disclosure is moving forward so fast now that they're actually going to tell us about this much sooner. You see now why I wanted to leak all this intel for the first time right here on stage with the security guard? <laughs> okay? This is very sensitive intel and you guys are the very first people to ever hear this. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> so he said this on, this was January 12th, and he said last night Maurice Cotterell was on coast and admitted that he was aware of three mile long flying aircraft carriers just like the ones we see in the Avengers and in Captain America. And he said they just finished the R&D on these flying aircraft carriers and in order to service them because they're in the sky, they used F-22s and F-35 airplanes. So they're flying these airplanes up to these aircraft carriers that are cloaked, and they're getting ready to tell us about that stuff too because they built new ones. The F-22s and F-35s have had so many runs in order to properly do the work that's needed to go up and down from these things that now the planes are already wearing out even though they were brand new when they started. So this is a huge effort that's being made. Now what are they going to have? They're going to announce weapon systems that shoot laser solitons. The laser soliton will travel forever until it hits something solid, and this is part of the technology they need to actually take down Draco ships, which now the Earth Alliance has. The soliton can go through an eight-foot hull and penetrate directly into nuclear warhead racks. They can get rid of anything. They can shoot it down into the ground, take care of anything they need to take care of. They have things that will take aircraft out of the air, Russia has a nasty plane now, and he thought it was called the S-23. This is all part of the briefing, and it goes on. Finally, I get to the subject. Do you know anything about ancient ruins being discovered in Antarctica? And I didn't say anything else. Now, he doesn't go online. He didn't see my website. He didn't know that I had leaked anything about this. This was totally original. And he says, everybody's been there. Obama, Trump. Whoa. He let that one go. Buzz Aldrin. How did Buzz get altitude sickness, he asks me. I heard he said, holy shit, seven times before he reached an altitude of 200,000 feet. 200,000 feet. Yeah, that's way outside the Earth. Because the acceleration is so fast, he'd never seen anything like it, and they had a window for him, so he flipped out. They went around the moon, saw the back of the moon, and then... He saw all this stuff on the back of the moon, all these civilizations, and it totally tripped him out. Then they come back towards the Earth, and they go around one of these floating space station aircraft carriers I was just telling you about, and then they tipped the wings. The plane goes like this, whoop, and it shows it's like a hello to the aircraft carrier. Gave him a wing wave. So this is what ended up leading to him having a heart attack. Obama was told, you too can go through a leaf grinder if you say a word. 
even if you breathe it at night while you're asleep. And this is, they talk to Obama like this all the time. It's really sad. The president does not get a lot of respect, to say the least. And this is where it's funny. And this is what he said, you know, take it for what you will. He said, that's the real Obama and not one of the stand-ins. The real Obama has been locked up for almost six months now. Yeah, isn't that weird? And this gets into the idea of potentially cloning people and that you can have clones that are programmed to be like the original or lookalikes. We don't really... There's different ways they can do this. I don't know if this is true, but, you know, I just listened to him and I'm telling you what he said. So you can take it for what you will. Now, he talks about the craft. Oh, the C is there because when I po post things in, I have to put a character there in order to make it so it actually looks white and proper. So it's, I forgot to delete that one. I apologize. He said they have planes, and this is his funny way of talking. It's not spaceships. He says they have planes that fly regularly to Mars and the moon. He's admitting this now. I say, planes? Not exactly the same kind of planes you're thinking of in the public eye. I said, are you talking about the black triangles with the dome on the top? Yes, that is one type. Then we go on. And the darts. And I explain what the darts are. That's what Corey's been describing. We had images of it last night, if you want to see that talk. He said, that is another type. I can't mention anything unless you already know what it is. So basically, I have to know the answer first, and then he'll confirm that it's true, and that's how he's able to stay alive. He can't tell me anything I didn't already know. Now, this was really cool. This made me feel amazing. He told me, and I'm typing as fast as I can what he's saying, you, David, are considered a hero to the Alliance. These, isn't that awesome? <laughs> and for God's sake, let me drink some water here. He said the people in the Alliance would love to disclose the things that you, David, are disclosing, but when they try, they end up making fat sharks. <laughs> they get fed to the sharks with concrete galoshes. So they love the fact that I'm out there. He said, David, there are so many people who wish they could be on this stage. Well, he, let's say he was here now. So many people that would wish they could be on this stage tonight doing the presentation that I'm doing for you right now. And it gets to be me. So that's pretty freaking awesome. So thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay, let's go on. So let's get back to this thing about the aircraft carriers. What exactly are they loading onto these ships? He said they have weapon systems that weren't set to be disclosed for 100 years. That's what they're loading in carriers and airplanes. Is it stuff that will look like flying drones but full-sized? And I, of course, you know, he's not going to tell me unless I already have the answer. Corey had already told me this. He didn't know that. And he totally confirmed it. He said yes. And then he goes on to say they have dozens of prototypes of three different size drones. They have been using actual drones, the real ones, in movies for almost four years now. And this includes the movie Edge of Tomorrow featuring Tom Cruise. That movie had real technology in it. And it looks very real in the movie. It's like, wow, you know? What, how do, they built a lot of sets for this movie. And they have that thing. It's like a metallic robotic suit that he wears, also in the movie Avatar. So the movie Avatar is not fiction. It's d disclosing the space program, going to other planets and mining, and having indigenous populations that they then wipe out in order to do, to, to, to get the materials they need. That's, that, that movie is true, and the technology in it is true. And he said to me, sometimes they run out of money on these film budgets, and instead of trying to build the thing, they just haul in one of the real ones from an underground base and film it. It's crazy. Those were real units. So this is something Corey sent me. It's got actually eight propellers on it, four on the top, four on the bottom. It is a powered drone. And so one of the things that Corey's disclosure has said is that they are planning on releasing these craft to the public eye soon. And it's going to start with propellers, and then when they get to the point that they declassify anti-gravity, then they're just going to take off the propellers. They're already built modularly to take off the propellers and stick on the anti-gravity cells. So this, this is going to be something that we're going to see very soon as part of the disclosure. So again, 
if this stuff really starts to happen, you heard it here first. Why would all the other stuff I'm saying then be wrong? This is how we're going to get full disclosure. This is why we were told, tell the people everything. Because we're not going to wait 50 years for this so that these guys are more worried about that they don't ever want to possibly get in trouble while we have things that need urgent attention on earth right now. So full disclosure. Absolutely. And the briefing goes on. He starts to describe these three different craft and other things. He said, we have an airplane. Well, that's what he likes to call it. There's an airplane that flies up to 200,000 feet at a speed of Mach 12 or 14. That's what actually caused Buzz Aldrin to say holy shit seven times. <laughs> it doesn't require any fueling. Most of these craft go and hide behind a bigger craft, meaning like a space station. These space stations, or platforms as he calls them, are camouflaged from outer space at the bottom. So you can't see them from the surface of the Earth. And this is how he describes it works. Stars move across these craft at night at random and different brightnesses. It looks like there are clouds in the sky below these craft from virtually every angle you could see on the entire surface of the Earth. Let's say that the, that the space station is a disk that's half a mile in diameter. They make a cloud beneath it that's five miles in diameter, and they also back project on it what it looks like behind the craft. And these technologies work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So there's all this stuff in the sky right now, back projecting holographic images of the stars behind them, and you either see that or you see the cloud. And they're already there. They're just getting ready to turn off the cloaking and show us what they got. Isn't that gonna be crazy? It's amazing stuff. Cloaking is very widely used. Then we get into Antarctica and beings. This is where it gets really interesting. Have you heard anything about giant pre-Adamite bodies being found in the Antarctic ice, complete with elongated skulls? This is a very loaded question, but I want to see what he's going to say when I throw this at him. Yes. And then he goes on to say, not only did they find dead ones, but they found living ones that are in stasis chambers. And these are new excavations. They estimate the stasis beings have been there for at least 800,000 years that we know of. Now, he had written all this down. He has diabetic neuropathy, and he doesn't always remember dates very well, and his handwriting isn't necessarily readable to himself. And this was a briefing. He was writing things down as fast as he could, and they said to him, we want you to tell David this stuff so I can share it with you. Isn't that cool? <laughs> So it appears that he's, his five looks like an eight, because later on I said, is it possible that it was 500,000 years? He said, yeah, yeah, because, you know, I wrote it in a funny way, and they told me so much stuff I couldn't remember everything. They wanted me to get this to you. I've done that. But I'm just telling you exactly how he said it at first. So this does appear to be 500,000 years ago. Now, that's freaking crazy, because what that means is that some of the people from the original Mars civilization, all the way back half a million years ago, put themselves in stasis chambers that work so well that some of the surviving half-million-year-old stasis chambers are still there in Antarctica inside these ships that crashed. And, and then I tell Corey, and he's like, you weren't supposed to know that. <laughs> he was shocked. Well, guess what, dude? Pete's people are telling me that they want me to know that. Your people are telling me, oh, don't tell David. Well, there's two different factions. Not everybody's apparently coordinating on this. They were hiding from the Anunnaki as well as other people. The Anunnaki here, he's referring to Draco reptilians, of course. Because Anunnaki just means extraterrestrial. There's different types. So then, this is where it gets really amazing. Corey had not leaked this to me. They found a gigantic mothership under the ice with a new satellite that uses a lower-than-infrared imaging system. They found a man-made object, without any question, buried three miles below the surface. It was about 30 miles in diameter and looked like a craft. Now, this is where he gets really interesting. They, how did they get down to this craft? Now that they find it, and it fairly was recently, apparently, that they found it. 
How did they get down there? He said they made some things that shot large plastic bags of water down that three-mile chute as they dig the chute, and then they flash boil it with microwaves, and they eliminate the first 40 feet of ice on top of these things of snow. So in other words, the bag gets dropped, they have very high-powered microwaves, they hit the bag with the waves, suddenly it turns into steam, and the steam evaporates the ice, and that's how they dig down to the craft. I explained this to Corey, he said, wow, how, you know, you weren't supposed to know that either. <laughs> then they followed it with pictures. Uh-huh. So they start taking pictures of the craft. Obviously, we're not seeing them. They found round ports, rectangular ports, square ports, knobs, antenna bumps, sensor bumps, telescope bumps. This was a huge thing. It was obviously a craft. Craft were taking off from two different directions, the front and the back of the mothership. It had little holes in it where craft would go in and out. The craft would come in from two directions and they would cross over one on top of the other inside the craft on conveyor belts. So this was a little bit more complex than what he explained. I'll give it to you in more detail. He said some are on the top half of the craft and other on the bottom. So what this means is the craft has a hole on one side, a hole on the other side. There's a conveyor belt with sockets in the shape of different types of UFOs. The UFO literally drops into the craft, it sits in the socket nicely, and then the conveyor belt moves forward and another socket shows up, and then that one pops in, and it goes on and on like this. And what was amazing was that I go back to Corey with all this stuff. Well, let's get to that in a second. First, he had more to say. Those things, these motherships, will take craft that we've already seen and call UFOs, and they actually can hold them inside. The motherships are set to hold a craft that would be the shape and size of sliding panels that slide around on this thing. Sometimes, uh, I, I was typing so fast, that one isn't very clear. But he's talking about the sliding conveyor belt. The thing on the inside goes in, the socket goes in, and then it rotates by 90 degrees and turns into the conveyor belt. So it kind of pops out like little egg holders. Now you've got a big hole on the side. They take off out of the front and go in in the back. And then I say, I have other intel that suggests they found a craft that had crash-landed near ancient builder race ruins in Antarctica and that they had to cannibalize their craft in order to build a settlement. Have you heard anything like that? And he said yes, he confirmed that was true. And then he said they also found an active city of 35 to 40,000 people who were still alive inside those craft after all this time, still living in there. Isn't that crazy? That was the big thing everyone went down to look at, and they wanted to meet some of these new people. We apparently are revered by them. Corey then confirmed this was true, but said that they actually are afraid of us because of our warlike nature. They consider us to be the relatives of their great, great 800,000-year-old ancestors, which again, he had the number wrong, it's 500,000 years old. But we are like long distant cousins, and so they see us as their long lost family, and they're very excited about that. Everything we have in still orbit, meaning all the classified space stations and stuff, is now hanging over Antarctica and looking to the other side to look for all these artifacts, because now it's like fully active. This wasn't known about before, it's fairly new. So, Corey then. I, I go to him and I say, Corey, did you hear about a 30-mile-wide mothership? And he said, yes. And then he tells me that actually there was three of them that have been discovered. And the code names for these ships, believe it or not, are the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. <laughs> <laughs> it's the original remnant of the fallen angels, the Luciferian people, the, the pre-Adamites. They're tall with elongated skulls that turned into what we now call the Illuminati that are actually still running the planet, or they were up until this alliance thing happened. Corey confirms the three motherships. He confirms the sockets. Well, he didn't know about the sockets, actually. That was new to him. But he confirmed that they held multiple spaceships inside, and those spaceships could go outside the Earth's atmosphere but they didn't have enough fuel to travel outside the solar system. So they stayed within our solar system, and then the Draco were warring with them, so they really didn't leave the Earth. 
But he said some of the craft that were found inside the motherships were like the Vimanas, and they looked like depictions that we see in Vedic artwork, and some of them look like what we see in Tibet, the stupas. Very interesting. So we have these ruins down there, and Corey has said, and Pete has said, that the plan is that they wanted to roll this out slowly. They start with a very conventional thing of it's just ruins and it's just humans, they didn't want us to see the giants right away because that's too much too fast. But now I'm telling you about that part. And then eventually they reveal that they have a secret space program. They reveal the craft that they used to fly Buzz Aldrin around the backside of the moon, causing him to have a heart attack. Then they say, oh, isn't it interesting? We found ruins like this also on Mars and on the moon. They look very similar, which I showed you pictures of already. Then they're opening it up to full disclosure, and at some point we start finding out about ETs. And the reason why they're doing this is that this is the cosmic history of the Illuminati. This is what they believe to be their lineage, that they came from the exploded planet and from Mars and from Saturn. That's why it's called the Cult of Saturn or Kronos. And they use the Saturn logo all over the place. The Rolling Stones have that album, Their Satanic Majesty's Request. Yes, that was the title. And it has Saturn right sitting there on the top in the image. So now I'm going to summarize this for you. It's a little after 10.30, so I didn't run that far over. Evidently, this is what Pete was saying as a summary, and this is his own words that I transcribed. Evidently, it will change our entire world forever, just knowing the information. My problem and your problem, and, and for the people in this audience, and the military knew that they were going to be talking to you when he said this, my problem and your problem is for us, this is normal stuff. It's cool, but we can handle it. We don't realize what a huge impact this will have on most people. We may also end up adding things to what we hear based on our own personal beliefs, and we need to avoid that. So, to, to roll this thing out, I want to show you again, if you didn't see last night's talk or the visuals on that screen weren't very good, now that we got the right screen, what we're going to see when we're finally allowed into many of these gorgeous underground cities like the one that's in Antarctica, and there's many of them. Now, this is stuff that Corey found online that looks very similar to what he actually saw, so probably whoever did this art was getting some kind of telepathic download based on the reality of what's down there, and they see this psychically, and then they draw it. Or maybe they have another lifetime or, or some kind of... Maybe they're being visited. Who knows? This is an example of what it looks like inside the underground areas. They do have caves and vegetation and running water and forms of light caused by light-emitting bacteria on the surface. We see stuff like this. We see caves with water. And then they hollow out those areas and they build facilities in them. And that's where they live, these underground beings. This is another one that he said looks fairly close to what he actually saw. Again, again, this was kind of randomly done by an artist, telepathically most likely. Another example of an artist getting really close without actually having seen it, telepathically most likely. And then this is one of the early commissions that we got. It wasn't entirely accurate. There isn't really enough stuff there. There's too much rock, but it was fairly close. It was the first attempt we made. And some of the new stuff, this is one of the brand new ones that he just, just commissioned, and nobody's seen it before, except for last night. This is the Anshar craft. You see the bell craft. You see the cigar-shaped craft. You see these huge pillars filled with lights because people are living in those pillars of rock. There's cities along the ground. There's domes with glowing light, and the light is, like, opaque so that you can't see inside. It gives them some privacy. Then you also have these egg-shaped craft that I showed you before. And that's down there on the right, the egg-shaped craft. Here is an image of Corey with Kari standing in front of what it actually looks like. Now notice, interestingly, how similar this is to what those people telepathically downloaded psychically that it actually looks like. This is another illustration, and I, I, I had to really level with him. I'm like, Corey, how real is this, because this looks freaking fantastic. It's so high-tech, it's so crazy. All these domes with all these lights on them. There must be millions of people living in there. He said, yes. 
This is a very close rendition of what I actually saw, and it's incredibly vast, and there are millions of people living down there already, and there's room for many more in certain areas that they've made for us because there are going to be problems with the sun that will require us to relocate. And so it's kind of like Santa Claus, right? He's got the naughty list, and he's got the good list. And you really probably want to be on the good list. Because if you're on the surface of the earth, it may not be very nice. <laughs> to say the least, it could be another Atlantean kind of thing. So this is all part of this ascension idea. I believe Corey is a harbinger. It's not stuff that's only happening to him. You're not only seeing this on Cosmic Disclosure, and boy, I wish whatever was happening to Corey would happen to me. No, this is going to become our reality. We're going to get tours of these places. Maybe not where all the Anshar are, but they have other ones that will look very cool that we'll be able to go to. And so, what I'm concluding with now is a statement that we are on the threshold of potentially some of the most amazing releases of knowledge in the entire recorded history of humanity. This type of a disclosure is as significant as the advent of someone like Jesus coming on earth if he actually did, in fact, do the things that the Bible says that he did. It's as significant as what happened to Muhammad, if you believe what's in the Quran. It's as significant as what happened to Moses, if you believe the Old Testament. It's as significant as what happened to Krishna, if you read the Mahabharata and the Drona Parva and other books like that, the Vedas. It's as significant as the Tibetan ascended masters like Padma Sambhava reaching rainbow body and ascending and 160,000 documented cases of that happening. What is going to occur, if this is true, is so vast, it's so amazing, it's almost hard to imagine. You can be a radiant light and transform the world with your love. And you can know in the greatest sense that indeed you are the light. You are the love. You are the one infinite creator now and forever. This cannot be threatened and it cannot be changed. And so it is. And now I'd like you to take a nice deep breath. Come back to your physical body. We went way into the ocean. Deep sea fishing, I call it. Wiggle your fingers, wiggle your toes. And now when you're ready, I'd like everybody to stand up. <laughs> Audience participation exercise. You know if you've been to my events, we do this. Whatever's appropriate, share the love. Give your neighbor a handshake or a hug. Don't keep it all locked up inside. <laughs> 